All right, everybody, it's 4.30, we'll get started. And we got Mr. Crown coming in. Uh, I believe we have enough people here. Ryan, can you do a roll call? Yep, uh, Mr. Lyons. Here. Mr. Petty. Here. Mr. Pinzer. Here. Commissioner Rock. Here. Uh, the Commissioners Moss, Milfeet, and Pa are all absent. Uh, the Commissioners Moss and Pa said that they will be joining uh, later on. Okay, if we can keep an eye out for them. And Tom was for sure not going to be here. Okay. All right. Um, I want to remind or first, did everything get posted correctly as yeah. required? Uh, we need to do a quick uh, revision on agenda before you guys uh, let Meredith uh, explain what is going on. Yes, here is your instructions. I accidentally wrote the words public hearing in half of the items on the consent agenda. Yes, yeah, those that. public hearings are already conducted and have been closed according to the proper procedure. I reposted the agenda earlier this afternoon in all of the usual places on the building <laughs> and updated in the meeting packet. So it's my understanding per Bill Punkany that all you need to do is adopt the agenda as Posted and amended and proceed with that bill. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. So we just we can amend the agenda at any time prior to the meeting, um, as Meredith said, and then if we get it posted prior to the meeting, then we just take notice of the amended agenda and adopt as posted uh, and then move on with your business. OK, commissioners, do we have a motion to adopt the Agenda as amended. I move to adopt the agenda as amended. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, we'll adopt the agenda as amended. All right, and I want to remind the commissioners if you had had any ex parte or any complex of conflicts of interest with any of the applicants or applications. Uh, please let us know at the time of that particular application. All right, uh, moving on. Um, has everybody had a chance to review and approve the minutes of the April 4th meeting? Or are there any questions, uh, corrections? May see anything that they have questions on? Uh, hearing none, if everything looks good, I'm open for a motion to approve. I move to approve the April 4th meeting. Second. Meeting minutes. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in, to approve. All in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, the minutes have been approved. All right, uh, we will move to our first uh, preliminary development plan review the pre app for a rezone and conditional use permit regarding the golf course at uh, 924 and 925 Fairway Drive in Reedy Lane. I believe we have Eric. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Eric McCormick, Golf Course Superintendent with the City of McCall Golf Course. Um, here, basically, to go over the preliminary development plan. Uh, I've added some of the projects that are in the work. Um, Year-round bathrooms. Uh, we're talking about a permanent. A uh, roof structure where the tent area is right now with a wall in the back of it to protect the homeowners back there. We'll have more information on the, on the when we come back. Um, 
we're looking at uh, extending the east side of the clubhouse for a uh, put a golf course simulator in to make revenue in the winter time and keep people out of the snow. And uh, then we need some more storage room uh, of a half, uh, but an additional half shed uh, like we built earlier um, in the maintenance area on the yard across 3D for equipment storage. And I think there's another one, another couple of things we'll come up with when we get the plan all put together, but um, we'll follow up with those in the further plan. So I'm open to questions and suggestions. So we're just addressing the uh, plan development that you're doing, not the conditional use permit that's on? Okay. Um, so on the east side expansion, how far, I mean, is that going to cut that access or how is how far out are you thinking? No, it, on, on the, it would actually fill in the area basically where the carts get the car park right now. And they'd still have that pathway coming yeah. through. Okay. That wouldn't change. And the bathrooms out there between three and four, whatever that would be. Actually, those the, where the bathrooms we're looking at is between uh, would be five birch and seven birch. Or the, there's a porta potty there now. Oh, okay. That would be the oh down from the snack shack. Yeah. Okay. So those would be year round, so the walkers could use them in the winter. We've got some LOT funding for that, and we're going to use some capital funds too to do that. All right. Uh, commissioners, any other questions for Eric on that? I do not have any. No questions for me. Nope. Yeah, I think I mean that seems pretty self-explanatory on those items. Okay. Anything else? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, so it was on our agenda, we had a conditional use permit application. That's not. Yeah, so um, we don't have a land use. Uh, we don't have a zone that is a, that makes a country club or a golf course a permitted use uh, by right. Um, so. No matter what he rezones it to, it needs a conditional use permit. Um, but the bigger uh, that's more ancillary than the rezone itself, which I think is going to be uh, more substantive and it'll allow some flexibility in their design and how they operate uh, without having to go through conditional use permits or design review every time they want to do minor projects like bathrooms and minor expansions, uh, things like that. Um, so that's what the rezone to Civic accomplished? Yeah, I mean, it's also just more consistent with how the light is being used in Arizona residential zone. So that does need to uh, fit in with the current deed and everything that has restrictions for golf course and golf course uses. Right. So is there anything regarding like the tent, what that's doing? Because, you know, obviously there's been a variety of events and stuff there that are not necessarily the golf courses, the weddings and I think there's been a few other events they have had there during that. So how is that going to come in? Is that what they have to get so a the permit plan right now is to permit the uh, tent and associated events uh, through a development agreement and we can put more specific conditions on that and limit hours of operation and make sure there's sound mitigation and things along those lines. OK, and then I know one thing that I've seen in the past on this, obviously we have to notify the neighbors um, with the course that pretty much has to be the Pretty much the entire course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're 300 we've feet. Got a lot of neighbors. Yeah. Right. So you're aware of that because I know in the past we've seen some that don't didn't cover the whole course. Like no, it's the course, not necessarily cedar because it's separate. No, we'll right. we'll be notifying a lot of people to uh, come come to the golf course and have a meeting. Okay, so obviously you anticipate it this summer, so we'll probably have a majority of people in town to be able to particip participate in that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty much all I have for now. Very good. I'll be back. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. All right. Um, we'll move on to the next free application. We have a potential bed and breakfast uh, due to be determined Sampson Trail. Do we have a Cody Monroe with us? Cody Monroe, are you online or here? If you're on the phone, you may need to hit star six to unmute yourself. Oh, 
nobody doing anything? Well, in the meeting real quick and we can get to him at the end of the meeting if we still have the mental capacity. <laughs> that he shows. All right. Yeah, Cody Monroe, one more time on you out there. Or anybody representing him. All right. All right, commissioners, we'll move on at this point to the consent agenda. Um, are there any items that you would like? Oh, hello. Wait, we heard something. Or not? Is there somebody wanting to comment? I guess not. OK, commissioners, anyway, back to the consent agenda. Is there any items that you would like to be pulled off there to uh, talk about individually or have questions on any of them? Fortunately, I sat through the last meeting, so <laughs> yeah. All right, well, if everything looks good, I'm open for a motion. I move to approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve. All in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, the consent agenda has been approved. All right, now we will get to the right spot here move on to old business we have a design review 2304 and scenic route 2308 to to be determined stib night for the mccall donnelly school district and is kirsten dietrich here yeah kirsten's online online hi yeah i'm here hi kirsten. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead and proceed with your presentation yeah, um, I'm not sure that there's much of a presentation to give at this time, except to um, just state that the school district and the city of McCall met in an offline meeting and um, came to mutual agreement about the terms and conditions of approval for the project that I think Brian um, Parker could probably read off if that works. Uh, yeah, we'll get to staff report here in a second, just if there was anything else you would like to add. I don't think so. We're just okay. happy to have um, resolution as a team. OK, great. Uh, Brian, if you'd like to give staff report. All right, yes, thank you. Um, as uh, Kirsten said, we had a good meeting with the school district and their team. Uh, came to some resolution, particularly regarding the uh, deed restrictions and undergrounding of utilities. As an effort to further local housing, the city is uh, waiving the deed or the uh, undergrounding requirement and will wrap it into future projects and use some franchise fees that we get through NO Power to facilitate that. Um, and uh, the school district has agreed to deed restrict the project. So. Okay, great. And then on that last meeting, that was yep. a big item. And with the improvements that they're doing to the sewer line, that's given them the sewer district's fine with the nine or eight hookups or the nine hookups eight. They uh, have uh, enough capacity. They're good with that. To serve okay, perfect. Um, the um, drainage addressed with the camp. Yeah, I'll uh, let Kirsten speak to that, but they did meet with okay. Camp Pinewood again, and I believe that fairly goes out. Yeah, we um, Camp Pinewood actually did um, some digging of their records on their side of things and found a stormwater plan that had been recorded with one of their previous plan approvals with the city of McCall, and it outlined some stormwater holding area and a culvert location that they they weren't necess the current operations folks weren't necessarily aware of that historical stormwater management plan. And I think they communicated that to public works and planning staff as well. Um, but anyways, we, the land group sat down with them and met and make sure that they understood their stormwater management plan and their, they were gonna go ahead and move forward with kind of implementing some of those, um, some of the, some of that work. Uh, we're, we're also kind of staying in contact with them just to kind of assist them since they're getting up to speed with what needs done from a stormwater management 
perspective, I guess. So I think it's the best of all all things. Okay, great. Um, Morgan, do you have any more reports you would like to add on this one? Yeah, I've been working with them to finalize their construction plans and we're moving forward with those designs and they're almost complete and ready to go. Okay. Yeah, since we've already seen this. Uh, commissioners, any other questions for staff or the applicant? None for me. All right, well, this item is not a public hearing, so um, commissioners, there's discussion. I think the, about the biggest thing that we had, I believe, and from our last meeting was, um, well, the two things were the, the bearing of the power lines, which we thought was going to be excessive costs. So that's been resolved. And I think there was some concern of potentially what would happen with the um, Camp Pinewood across the street, which that seems like that's resolved. Um, I really don't see any outstanding issues in this one. Any other comments or thoughts with from you, everybody? I know you nope. they weren't here to see a lot of that, but <laughs> we already went through a good portion of the, yep. the project and this is just the first phase of it. So it's going to be moving forward in a couple phases. Yeah, I, I thought, uh, you know, the applicant and the city did a great job of, of working together to resolve those uh, issues and I think it's ready to go. I, I would agree. I don't have any questions or anything to add at this point. So Brian, to confirm this, because there were some changes with some of the packet, the conditions of approval as stated are everything's accurate. There's not many changes or anything with and late information. That's correct. Okay. Well, I think we're all pretty much in agreement. Open for a motion. I move to approve. DR 2304 and SR 2308 with the staff recommended conditions of approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, the motion is carried. All right, and I've got, let's see, you update this. So the next. Item that we did have has been continued. Let's see where we got here. Hold on. Yes, yeah, been continued. Um, so the Mill Road property, uh, the glass house has been continued to the next meeting. So the next item. We need to, we need to vote. Oh, that's right. We need to open for a motion to continue the uh, design review 2227 and shoreline 22. 05 to our next meeting in June. Was it six? June six. So moved. All right. So second. we have a motion and a second to <laughs> have a motion and a second to continue that application to our next meeting. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right. That motion is carried. We'll move that one to the next meeting. And we have. Uh, design review 2301 and shoreline 2301 at 2225 Edgemere Lane. Uh, do we have Eric Anderson here in the audience or is he online? Online. Okay, great. Eric, yeah, if you'd like to uh, show us your presentation, you that'd be great. Yep. Okay, uh, I'm just, I'm teleconferenced Dan. I didn't, uh, so. Um. So yeah, we've got, uh, we're proposing to build a, uh, there's an existing structure, 2255 Edgemere Lane. Um, it's old and uh, the, the new owners, we're gonna plan to remove the existing structure and place it with about a 3,400 square foot home and a two car garage with um, associated site improvements and um, decking and whatnot. Uh, we've been working closely with the staff to go through uh, the planning process and get to the to design review level. Um, we've met the height restrictions, I believe. Uh, setbacks are good, and we also plan to use uh, natural vegetation once the project is complete. Um, uh, that uh, you know, we've gone through the the site specific co comments, and 
And you know, most of the comments that we need to address will be handled and addressed during the permit process. So with that said, I, I really don't have any questions. Um, and then stand for any comments or questions from uh, commissioners. Okay. Um, commissioners, unless you have any questions, we'll have Brian give staff report. Um, I'm just um, curious, your dimensional standards, There, you seem to submit a plan with um, some discrepancies to our requirements. Was there a reason for that? Uh, was that the setbacks? Setbacks, lot coverage. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we worked through that. We've set up new plans and um, and working with Brian, you know, we we agree if there's some something minor that somehow we're we're not seeing correctly together that we would adjust it because it's uh, the site lot coverage is. From what we understand of the in our discussions of how to calculate that, we are at twenty one percent and we're allowed twenty two percent lot coverage. And we did have a couple dimensional errors, which we have corrected that uh, address the setbacks. Okay, and then you did mention you're not going to put all that grass in towards the lake. You've changed that no, as well. No, there will be no no lawn. It's all natural vegetation to be replaced once construction is complete. My two main concerns, yeah. All right. So yeah, so uh, you know, when we submit for permit, you know, we'll make sure you know any of these small descriptions. We've we actually sent some final plans in this morning. Um, but well, yeah, any minor setbacks. You know, we had like six inch uh, dimensional error. You know, it could have been software error. So you know, well, any of those little things we'll address at the time of permit application. All right, Ryan, would you like to do staff report? Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, this application uh, is for a new single family residence. Uh, they are partially reusing its existing structure on the property. Uh, it is a fairly large house. It it's almost touches on almost all the maximums of dimensional standards uh, exceed the pr previous plans exceeded uh, them in both directions. Uh, they have submitted updated plans, which I printed out for you guys. Um, I recommend keeping the condition of rule as is, just in case I, it's reviewed. Uh, they're updated. Plans. Um, it's generally consistent with our design guidelines. Uh, for low pitch roofs, hold snow, um, lots of glass windows. The uh, one question that we had early on was determining uh, whether their 50 foot shoreline setback measurement is correct or not. Uh, it is difficult to get an accurate survey of the ordinary high water mark when the ordinary high water mark is under five feet of snow. Uh, so there is a condition to get survey done. That'll say pretty questions. So if the survey shows it's closer, they're open to make adjustments if needed on. Yeah, it's, I mean, the sense of the building and the landscaping and patios and all that. They can bump that up against it. They're probably going to be right back to square one, which is why the condition approval is written as it is that they're aware that they're going back to square one. If it's OK, yeah, if we if, if we, the survey comes back and we're encroaching on that 50 feet, we know we can we have a plan to move the house up into the lot further to the east and get away from that 50 foot. But. From what we can do right now, um, we we feel like we're we're outside of the 50 foot, but until we can get an accurate survey, we we can't uh, prove that. So that's one of the conditions we we would like to move that we um, obtain that survey prior to permit and make adjustments accordingly if needed. Okay. Any other items, Brian? On I don't believe so. Main one. Morgan, any additional? Sure. Um, so I did review this project and they are missing some water items. I talked to one of their architects and there's a few notes on their plans on a few stormwater notes on their plans, but we still need a report and a stormwater application. Um, and just in general, identifying where all the runoff is going before it enters the lake um, 
that was my main comment on this project is to just get that figured out before building permit. And we have that in regular yeah. approvals condition. Correct. Okay. Commissioners, any questions for staff before we go to a public hearing? Brian, what page are the conditions on? It's showing up on mine as 134 or so. Yes, that is good. Thanks, Liz. Sure. And so we're going to the idea is to leave these the same, even though they've got an updated plans, just because that would cover anything yeah. and they could easily all good. Then those are easy. They probably have already met some of them potentially. <laughs> all right, I think we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, just want to remind everybody we got three minutes to make comments. I know most of you are probably not here for that item, but I think some are. Uh, but just in general, moving forward, we're going to have about three minutes. Uh, we'll need your name and address. And then if somebody prior uh, has spoken prior to you and they've said the comments you're going to say, just please say you agree with them and anything new. Otherwise, we could be here till late. and We've got a lot of items on the agenda. So with that, we will open up first to anybody online or on the phone that would like to speak regarding the item at 2225 Edgemere. We're just discussing that item at this point. So it's 2225 Edgemere. Uh, if you're on the phone, you may need to hit star six to unmute yourself. So anybody online or on the phone that wish to speak regarding this application? Anybody showing? All right, so um, I think I got a couple names here. I'll just see anybody here that would like to speak regarding this application. Got a couple names on the list here: Ella Torres and Rocco. Oh, subdivision. Okay, not the. I see in the twenty three oh one. All right. Um, well, hearing nobody to speak public comment, we will close the public hearing. Commissioners, discussion. So yeah, my two cents is the the plans as submitted being so non-compliant is concerning, but if uh, staff feels that the conditions of approval as stated will address those concerns, uh, I think it's I think the spirit and intent of the structure is compliant. Yeah, and, and Liz also we did get we haven't had a real chance to inspect them, but they did submit here uh, new plans okay. here at the meeting. So again, Brian's had just a preliminary time to look over them, but with those items, I think some of the items probably were already addressed, but as long as we keep those same conditions, it'll you know, make it easy if they've already done that, but so they have some set now yep. with us. Cool, works for me. Yeah, my questions were basically the setbacks on the shoreline to make sure those are gonna be within requirements. So they have, they have stated that they are gonna put go back to natural visitation, but there's that's not a condition of approval and there's nothing required. Um, um, I think the last condition of approval states that we will upon completion of construction will yeah, number eight. go back to natural. Yeah. So I'm playing up the staff report right now. Yes, yeah, so our goal here is in condition five and eight with the revised landscape plans and condition eight with the reseed with native grasses. Yep. So uh, are you guys have latest <laughs> Yeah, I believe these plans have this.
but yeah, the, the you may need to add that into just yeah, to specify the, the items you guys are reviewing uh, should still show the lawn area and all that. Um, I would maybe make motion that the landscape plan shall be consistent with the May 2nd uh, submitted documents. No, I think they have they still show grass, though. I don't think they have a new landscape plan in here. No, well, I've got one we submitted a little while ago and it, it, we have removed the lawn from it. The one that's on your screen here. Okay. The one that I use. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the conditions in there to replace the reseed the lawn of natural grasses and we plan and we will be doing that. The condition of approval that they're referring to is specific to the disturbed area around the building site, not removing the lawn on their plans that was originally in there. Um, so we took the lawn off the plans, so they're gone. It's gone. The lawn is off the plan. Yeah. This document uh, is dated February 24th that has the no lawn. No lawn. Uh, no. Not even green species. Now, Liz, if you want, we could maybe add something into into the conditions approval, either item five or eight, to say including, you know, to represent the new plan, the new landscaping plan, I should say. Yeah, that makes sense. And commissioners, any other thoughts, questions, or concerns? Nope, not for me. I think as long as we um, include that in the conditions of approval that we're removing the lawn. I think we're good. All right, well. Open for a motion. I'll take one on it. <laughs> you can wait. I'm just kidding. I move to approve DR 2301 and SR 2301 with the staff recommended conditions of approval with a modific modification to condition five to add the requirement for no lawn in the landscape plan. You know, that's a with building permit required to see a vote. Building permit. What was that, Meredith? Did you want that prior to building permit or condition or certificate of occupancy? I think building permit. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve with conditions of approval as amended. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none. As application has been approved. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, yes, you thanks. Time. thank you, Eric. All right, thanks, guys. Okay, moving on to new business. We have the McCall Fire Department, McCall Fire Development impact fees. Either Bill or Bill. Bill or Bill. Or Michelle. Or Michelle. I hadn't planned on presenting on this, but I certainly can if nobody else is available. I invited Bill Gigray. I didn't see any response from him. Okay. Bill, I think I'm, you're more qualified than me to talk about this. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. I'm I'm happy to run with this. Um, so, Commissioners Bill Punkety, uh, Attorney for the Planning and Zoning Commission, and City Attorney. Um, this is before you today. Um, because the McCall Rural Fire District is seeking to establish development impact fees pursuant to Idaho code. And the, I guess, in summary, the reason for pursuing development impact fees is to, um, development impact fees are, are a mechanism established under Idaho law, uh, whereby the cost of expansion of public services and facilities um, that's required by development um, 
can be uh, paid for through those fees by the developer. And so the, the underlying idea is that development pays for itself. And so um, what this process is, um, at least at the outset, and I think Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but the purpose of today's meeting is to just sort of outline what the process is and then sort of give the, the commission notice that we'll be moving forward with these various steps. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So the process for that is, you can see in your packet, uh, number one, formation of a joint development impact fee advisory committee. And the purpose of that development impact fee advisory committee is to review what's called a capital improvement plan, which designates how collected development impact fees can be expended. Uh, that DIFAC, the, the advisory committee, um, is, looks like we're pulling up the memo there, Meredith. There we go. Um, that advisory committee has uh, representation, um, uh, two members of whom have to be uh, engaged in the business of development within, uh, within the uh, McCall Rural Fire Protection District. Um, they will work, like I said, with city staff and with, or, and with the fire department for the establishment um, of the capital improvement plan and also the recommendation of uh, development impact fees. This involves the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission for two reasons. Um, the first is the comprehensive plan is going to require a, uh, an update to include the capital imp improvement plan. And so you will see that moving forward. Um, and second, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission will likely see the um, capital improvement plan uh, as we move forward. So. Um, like I said, the primary purpose of this is to give you a heads up of what's what's going on. It's a this is there's much more specific specificity in the memo that's attached, but for the purposes of the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, what you can expect is um, basically work on the comprehensive plan and a comprehensive plan amendment to reflect the establishment of the fees for the McCall Rural Fire Protection District. This is likely a precursor to development impact fees that will be uh, enacted and developed by the city. Um, the fire district is sort of a, uh, a pilot program for that. So um, I know I kind of gave a very cursory overview. I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but really the role of the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission will be that comp plan amendment. Any, any questions for me, Michelle, do you wanna add anything? No, I think you pretty much covered it. Um, I guess I would just add to the commission that we did do a work session with the city council to talk about impact fees, um, and they provided direction for us to to look at um, doing a study to better understand this topic. So it is something that at some point we'll probably be bringing forward to you. All right, Michelle, have you, uh, was there a plan on the selection of the the committee is that in started or what kind of what between that and what's the time overall timeline um that all still needs to be developed um so bill do you want to talk about the composition or are we getting too far out of line because we could also yeah. bring this item back to you at a future date too yeah i think i think this will come back um this is sort of a primer for the planning and zoning commission because you'll see that comprehensive plan amendment um I don't actually, because I'm not the attorney for the district, I don't actually know the status of the advisory co committee. Um, under the statute, that committee can be made up of, an, of a sitting planning and zoning commission. But um, if that's to be the case or even proposed to you, we will be providing you with significant advance notice about this new role that we're thinking we would foist upon you. Um, and so, you know, since that, that doesn't sound like that's happened, and I certainly haven't seen anything like that come across my desk or the Planning and Zoning Commission. I would anticipate that they've already uh, formed an advisory committee um, that's for the McCall Rural Fire Protection District, but you know that may not be the case. But to answer your question, um, it's at least five members, two of whom must be involved in the business of development. 
So just to clarify, the fire district does have their committee already in place. Okay. Um, so they they were working on this process. Um, if the city were to form a committee, it would likely look different than what the fire district has because of the boundaries. But um, like I said, we could always kind of do like a mini little work session on sort of the process and what's going to happen. At this point, it was very, very much a training for the city council and just kind of a heads up on where call fire district is in the process because um, they've been working at this for a while and they're also working with Valley County. So, um, so yeah, I think probably scheduling a future agenda item would be a, probably a better way to cover those kinds of questions. Yeah, so so like like we said, um, you, know, you can see on step eight is where we start to see the Planning and Zoning Commission becoming involved. And um, so you'll likely see uh, future agenda items on this topic, and those will be orientated primarily towards uh, the fire district. The city's involved at all because the impact fees have to be enacted uh, via an ordinance and the fire district does not have ordinance authority. And so uh, under Idaho law, if the fire district is to have these development impact fees, they have to use uh, by agreement the city's ordinance authority. And so that's why the Planning and Zoning Commission is even involved in this is because uh, for that purpose is to enact them for the fire district. Do you have a, I know it's probably hard to say, but a rough idea of a timeline. So we kind of have a heads up or at least staff does for any future developer developments coming in at a certain point, they're going to have some extra fees. I mean, are we looking, you think this year that we have to deal with it in the next three, four months, or is it going to be something to probably start January of next year? Yeah, Michelle, how far advanced are they on the CIP? Now, I I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little confused. Are you asking about McCall Fire District or the city? Well, any of the new impact fees. I mean, when do you expect this to you know, proceed so, through the process? McCall Fire District is, is moving through the process. So this is, um, I don't know exactly what they intend to be their effective date. Do you know that, Bill? Uh, no, I do know that they um, want to move forward with this. And I mean, that's why I was asking about the their stage of development with the CIP. So the capital improvement plan um, is formed upon the basis of a significant amount of statistics and mathematics to determine what the impact of a residential development or commercial development is on affected infrastructure, such as the fire district. And so, um, and that plan typically takes some time to develop. What I don't know is how developed that plan is as of now. Um, if it is done, and it's my understanding that the whole process is quite mature with the fire district, I would anticipate that you'll see this come through uh, on an agenda in the next couple of months. Um, we'll certainly want to probably have um, maybe a workshop on this or, or even another agenda item where we can really drill down and, and answer uh, some questions on that uh, before we have any determinative agenda items or um, before we have any public hearings. But um, you know, this is really the first touch uh, for the Planning and Zoning Commission. And we just wanted to let you know, hey, uh, here's a memo with the process very well laid out for the steps required to enact development impact fees for the fire district. It involves the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, and you'll likely see that coming up on future agendas and you'll likely have probably some additional information from staff on this topic. And I, I mean, what I'll add to Robert's question is, yeah, the city doesn't have a timeline um, or funding at this point, even for the study. So I would say we're at least a year out. OK, and probably the earliest. OK, great. But everybody will know about it. There'll be, I'm sure, a lot of public outreach and information yeah. about it when it gets kicked off. And, and to be clear, for the fire district, you know, probably sometime this year, if not in the next couple of months. Yeah, I think they're planning on moving forward. They're pretty far along in this process. And, oh, go ahead. Galena Consulting, is that that's who's working with the fire district committee? Um, uh, Based on Go the ahead. memo, that's what I've seen. Yeah. 
So you're re okay. you're requ you're required to hire an outside uh, professional consultant to develop the capital improvement plan, and that's where Galena Consulting comes in. Okay, great. Commissioners, any other questions? Nothing for me. Nothing All right. for me. Great. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Bill and Michelle, and we'll definitely be seeing more in the future, it sounds like. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Oh, hold on, Bill. We got Meredith has a question for you. Oh, sure. Step number eight, and I know that Bill Gray should probably be here. Um, it was my understanding that they're either supposed to move to set a future public hearing date at a subsequent meeting or set a date specific for the public hearing for the fire commission portion of the process. Today. That, that's the part that I didn't really understand, but maybe we could just have a have this come back up on the next agenda with better instructions from Bill Gray. Yeah, I, th I don't think we're going to set a public hearing today without something more explicit from them. Um, okay. And you know you, what we may do is just have a specific agenda item because looking at our agenda, I don't think we've got you know, even a proper agenda item to set a public hearing on this, do we? I don't feel that way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So so under the circumstances, I don't think we will be setting any public hearings today, and that certainly would be kind of the first step. Maybe after we really give a much more in-depth uh, review to the Planning and Zoning Commission of what they'll be doing. Um, would be to set a date for those public hearings. OK, great. Thank you very much, Bill. Yeah, sure. Thank you. All right, and that's not a public hearing. Uh, obviously, it'll be one in the future. OK, moving to our next item. We have design review 2306, scenic route 2305, shoreline 2305, uh, 149 East Lake Street. Uh, I believe Dave. Uh, Dave Pugh for Epcos. Are you here for Dave's James? On an adventure, so we have Emily. Oh, we got Emily. All right. So I'd like to come up. I believe Brian pointed to a new site plan. The latest site plan, but Maybe the new site plan. we have to give you an idea of what we're thinking. Oh, okay, great. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tommy Harrison. I'm one of the owners of 149 East Lake, where we hope to develop a small but nice and thoughtfully designed food truck lot. Oh, I know this is an important issue to a lot of y'all. It's a new concept for McCall. It's a pretty novel idea. As far as I know, we've never had a actually designed food truck lot, so we want to make sure we do it right. Um, this should come as no surprise to you, but I, for one, am excited. I think it's going to be a fun, positive, and pedestrian-focused development. And I think it's going to be great for McCall. Um, so, and again, thank you guys for being here and for your time. With that, I will introduce Emily from Epico. She tends to be a lot smarter than I am and can give you guys a lot of good information on the project. So thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thank you guys. Um, as Tommy mentioned, this is new for McCall. Um, Please give me a name. And oh, I'm Emily Bettin with Epicos Design at 303 Colorado. Um, and so we're really excited to present this to you and really thankful for staff's work on amending the code to make a project like this possible. Um, this is a unique pedestrian friendly opportunity for downtown and we're able to propose these improvements thanks to the code um, that has outlined the requirements and specificities that make this a compliant bidding project for downtown. Um, food trucks have been shown to act as an incubator model for restaurant startups, which supports the culture of the entire community. In addition to offering a lower barrier to entry to these small businesses, the food truck has an opportunity to offer lower priced and often faster product to both our local workforce and our visiting crowds. Another example of a project similar to this is the success of the terrace at Ponderosa Center. Um, this illustrates that a temporary installation in our downtown core is an asset to our community. 
the activation of these gaps in our urban fabric have and will continue to bolster adjacent businesses. Thanks to comments from agencies, staff, and the communities, we've made revisions to our plan since our original submittal in March and believe that all this feedback is made for a strong, beautiful, and most importantly, code compliant project. So the owners are proposing a temporary installation on a vacant lot at 149 East Lake Street. This will be a food truck court. The site will receive a compacted decomposed granite surface. And in order to create a pedestrian friendly urban environment, no vehicles will be allowed within the site, except for the food trucks to arrive and depart seasonally, as well as service for waste removal. Restrooms and a bear proof dumpster will be provided and both of these facilities will be screened with ornamental fencing, which you can see an example of on your imagery sheet. The vendors are going to be oriented in a way that preserves view corridors to the lake. Our town needs to embrace pedestrian oriented development and is indeed mandated to within the code. The adjacency to parks and shops makes this the perfect location to improve the staying power of our downtown. Guests and residents alike want to do more in one single trip and have shown that they are happy to park their vehicle once and enjoy walking in our constantly improving downtown. So no parking will be allowed within the site or within the right of way along the frontage of the property. No dedicated on-site parking is required within the central business district, but we are aware that there is concern around this topic and that there have been issues in the past. We've worked closely with Public Works to determine what measures can be taken to limit the likelihood of illegal parking in this location. And two new no parking signs with directional signage to the nearest public parking lot will be placed as directed by the city. The owner of this project also happens to own Market Square across the street and has pledged to work with the tenants to secure their existing dedicated parking. To satisfy ITD requirements, the improved existing driveway shall be asphalted to the back of the 20 foot radius. A primary pedestrian entrance to the site will be provided at the east side of the property closest to the existing crosswalk. This measure will help encourage pedestrians to use sidewalks and marked crossings to travel safely into the site. This east facing access is also oriented toward the densest pedestrian core of downtown linking this site to the rest of the urban environment. This will be highlighted with a trellis overhead feature to guide people to that location. We anticipate the local workforce, families and visitors walking and bicycling to this location from across McCall, as it will be an amenity to offer faster service and diverse offerings. The vendors shall supply their own site furnishings in order to provide seating to their patrons. Seating arrangements shall be confined to the gravel area per staff recommendations, and the owner will provide guidelines on the quality of the furnishings within the agreements to each vendor. Landscaping shall be provided along the highway frontage within planter boxes and two in-ground beds. Plantings will be native ornamental grasses and native flowering perennials. Fast growing species will have the most impact in a project with a temporary nature such as this. On each side yard near the front of the property, additional permanent landscaping will be installed. Conifers such as blue spruce are proposed along the west property line to maximize screening for the adjacent residential use. Shrubs such as service barrier golden current will be planted around the power meters along the east property line. Native grass or wildflower seed will be planted in all other areas of site disturbance. Five deciduous trees such as crab apple in movable pots will be provided. Four within the 25 foot setback or front property line and one additional tree located in the seating area. An automatic irrigation system is proposed. The existing fence along the, along the front of the property provides additional security for the pedestrian environment within the site and will encourage users to access via the main entry on the east side of the site. Pops will be planted along both this existing fence and the new trellis. Bollards will also be placed on the corner of the site near the main entry to protect pedestrians, as well as opening up the access to people of all. 
Power will be supplied to the vendors through extension cords from electrical meters installed on the southwest corner of the property. Water will be provided through new hose bibs with a new water meter. A gray water tank will be provided within the dumpster enclosure shared by the vendors to minimize the number of trips required by the vendors to handle this waste. No sewer connections are proposed for this project. As no impervious surfaces are proposed for this temporary use, stormwater is managed simply through direct infiltration. The existing vegetated hillside will provide treatment for any runoff. However, should the vendor court ever be paved, engineering calculations would be prepared and an infiltration basin would be constructed downhill of the vendor court. This area is shown on the plan to illustrate that ample space is available and anticipated. Limited grading is proposed for this scope of work, but if excessive erosion is, occurred, is observed, the owner will ensure that measures are taken to correct this issue. Okay. Any questions? Commissioners, any questions at this point? You, you kept repeating temporary. How many months were? Planning on placing a five year restriction on this application. And that's what 12 months that. a year. Correct that it could operate 12 months a year. Yeah. Um, however, the concentrated use is planned to be during the summer months when town is the busiest. Um, yeah, it's going to be a. I would say the longest May to the end of September and. There might be a couple weeks during our carnival when we set something up, but we'll make sure we do that right as well and we don't. We don't have any information on that yet. We had one truck last year that ran during this. <laughs> There's a possibility we're going to have a couple others ask, but. Hey, the, reason, the only reason I ask is you have snow stories in your map. Yep. So. Sorry to interrupt. It seemed like you were going to plow it all winter. It's shown just as an in case they do want to do a winter carnival application again, um, showing that we have enough space to store that snow. Um, however, it's not intended to run full time year round. You mentioned uh, extension cords going. How are you going to do that for the safety wise? I could see the the back four. You could run along the back where people wouldn't be walking, but that front one, you're going to have to cross something. You have a plan for? You're right. Yes, it could be a tripping hazard, but we're going to buy those. I don't know what they're called, the technical name for it, but those covers that you'll see it, you know, fairgrounds and events, the, I don't know, plastic or rubber covering that goes along the whole thing. Okay. So if you could get a wheelchair over it, you can step over it. It won't be a tripping hazard. Okay. And I notice on your new uh, site plan, it shows moving the Yacht Club dumpster. Is it currently on the property? Have you talked with them as far as where and what? And I gave the owner of that lot a call and to our understanding, it is slightly on our property. He didn't, he didn't know if it was, I guess that was a big issue years ago with different owners of both lots. Um, the owner of that current lot where the yacht club sits was under the impression that it was moved in the past and it is no longer on his or on our property at all. But he said he's fine with pushing it back if, if need be. And as, as far as I know, the survey shows that it is yeah, slightly. Our, our survey information is old, but based on visiting the site in person, it does appear to be pretty much right where we want to put that pedestrian oriented entrance. Um, and so we'll have to verify in the field um, if when we get a building permit and we can get someone out there to verify where that building corner is or the property corner is and get it out of the way if it is. Yeah, because that probably jogs right there, a little bit of a jog that's in there. So, I mean, from where that's at, how does it, I mean, I guess it kind of shows on here. So what you're showing is the current location of it, where it's across one of the planter yeah, best boxes. Well, that's where it is now. And so we would want it off of the property completely. And that would be up to them to find a suitable location for it. Okay. What is your plan for parking for your employees and everybody, I guess? Or not so much everybody, the main thing with the employees, do they have a plan for the parking of them or they're just out on their own? Uh, that first street public parking lot is where we're planning to direct everyone. 
Um, same as any other downtown business, we've got street parking and several public parking lots that serve our community. First Street is going to be torn up this summer, correct? Correct for utility installation and then and then the next summer for for the final paving and so you got two years to find parking. So my understanding is that it won't be closed this summer. There will be some temporary work. This is Morgan, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that it will still be available for public parking all this year. Um, and then next year the road will be closed, but kind of, I, know, I hate to say it this way, but it's a broader downtown issue. Um, we will be impacted the same as all other downtown businesses and we'll all work together to find places for employees to park suitably. Um, but this is a project that's improving our community. Um, you know, the second street projects have been hugely successful in improving pedestrian access. Um, it's worth doing, even if it is kind of a headache in the interim. Yeah, okay, I think we'll go to staff report for now. We may have some more questions for you. Do you want to sit down for that? Uh, yeah, you can probably sit down. We're going to be a couple, probably a couple minutes. Um, all right, Brian, staff report. Uh, thank you. Um, this, this application um, as discussed was the result of, or as an outcome from a code amendment process that went through uh, last year. Uh, prior to this year, this code amendment, uh, all temporary vendors were managed through vendor permits through the clerk's office. They didn't really have a lot of land use control to do landscaping improvements uh, required driveways, so on, so on. Um, so it was fairly minimal uh, process and uh, we're hoping that the updated code and the new procedures will uh, result in a better, more aesthetically pleasing product um, and allow for some more flexibility with the uh, local businesses and entrepreneurs. Uh, entrepreneurs. Um, this application um, is yeah, right now down next to the Yacht Club, um, provides spaces for five food trucks, uh, no vehicle access other than the food trucks coming in and out. Uh, the bollards uh, on the vehicle access point will be locked except for um, moving vehicles in and out and emergency situations as needed. Um, The conditions of approval include um, writing some design guidelines or examples of the uh, outdoor furniture, outdoor seating materials uh, that would be used on the site, and a design for the enclosure, the trash enclosure uh, around the trash and port bodies. Um, other than that, it meets the intent of the code. Um, there was a lot of public comment regarding. Uh, parking and the aesthetics. Um, again, we think with the screening of the dumpster and the port potties that is generally mitigated uh, along with all pretty extensive landscaping um, in temporary facilities. Uh, the parking in code does not require uh, on-site parking within central business or the, the renewal area. Um, and on-site parking on this would be a challenge um, because of left turn movements in and out of here, I think would be hard. And then also that's more stormwater mitigation right by the lake that would be required to take care of. Um, so the condition of approval is to uh, update the signage along the property, which is kind of on the bend on the Lake Street uh, for more no parking signage, and then install directional signage for the first street public parking lot. And that'll stand for any questions. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Um, is there any requirement for bike parking, like temporary bike parking on this type of property? Um, their uh, latest site plan does show bike racks on there. Uh, it is not in our bike parking minimum chart, uh, so it would be up to the commission to determine if time of design. Okay. Brian, the site plan that you're showing, that's not the latest one, correct? 
it is not. It's the latest that it was um, before the publication of the packet. I uh, emailed the latest one earlier today. Okay. Could you pull up the latest one? Yeah. I guess I could too, but. I don't have any questions at this point to it. I just thought it would be nice to see it. <laughs> uh, Morgan, would you like to? Yeah. Um, as Emily mentioned, um, we have worked through the stormwater items and there isn't really any impervious area being provided, <laughs> proposed by this project since it's all a gravel area and we have that condition in there that the pond will be adequately sized if paving is ever occurs. Um, the natural, the natural vegetation will provide a good buffer and infiltration before it enters the lake. Um, those were the bulk of my comments. I do have a comment in there of updating the site plan to show signage along East Lake Street. That's been required by staff. I'm not sure if that new site plan shows that, but I did send that information today. Um, so they probably haven't reviewed it yet um, after talking to the streets department. Um, and then that was pretty much all of my comments, but I did take a look at our construction plans for phase 3A, which is the construction happening this summer. Um, and the contractor needs to develop a construction staging plan to maintain access to the first street parking lot and to minimize closure closures as much as possible. Um, I don't believe we've seen that yet. We haven't had a pre-construction meeting for this project yet. That's to be coming. <laughs> And that is all I have. OK. Ryan, on the sign, the extra signage, that's going to be a, potentially a cost to the applicant, correct? Yeah. So they're doing signs along Lake Street. It's just going to say no parking. Um, is there something that they can have? Because I mean, people are going to park in Albertsons and park across the street, even though the owner has or the property has both. But you know that's going to happen. Or could they have any extra signage somehow on the property that says do not Park at Albertsons or that, or is that going too far to uh, ask I that? I think that may get pretty cluttered pretty quickly and uh, to be too much on. Yeah, I think directing them to make the right choice rather than directing them against making the wrong choice is going to be a little cleaner. Commissioners, any other questions before we go to uh, public hearing? I don't see on the site plan any sort of screening between the road and that um, food truck that is parallel to the road. Um, am I missing it or? All of the or rectangles are uh, planter beds. OK, fast growing native grass types. But wouldn't end up being very tall to really block the truck that's sitting behind it, correct? Probably not. Yeah, they, they provided a picture. You're probably looking about two feet tall based in the pictures they've provided us here at the meeting hall. So look like a couple two by 12 frame boxes roughly as far as just an example drawing that they are an example picture that they have. OK, thank you. Unless we want to do more screening across there. I mean, it would potentially block a little bit of Lake Peekaboo views, but it's still we wouldn't have a truck sitting right there on the backside of a truck. That would be that's, the back side. That's what I'm kind of weighing in my mind is what's what's better there. To, to block out the lake with some screening that also blocks the trucks or to <laughs> try to see a filtered view of the lake. Yeah.
OK, if you have any other questions for now, we'll go to the, open up the public hearing. And remind everybody to state your name and address when you speak. We're going to go people online first. And let's see. Well, it doesn't specifically say. Is there anybody online or on the phone that would like to make a comment regarding this application? Also, at the right. Oh, Tony is here. Oh, good. Hello, Tony. Welcome back. If you're out there. Okay, so well, we'll ask if the online or I mean people on the phone. Um, if you'd like to comment uh, the phone number here, and again, you may need to hit star six to unmute yourself. You got a phone number of seven zero two nine five six one zero one two. Are they muted? Seven zero two nine five six one zero one two. You're muted. If you'd like to speak, you need to hit star six. Once going twice. OK, we'll move to phone number three zero three eight two seven five one zero three. You like to comment. Again, if you like to comment, you need to hit star six. Last call for three zero three eight two seven five one oh three. Which one of these is Tony Visick? So we Okay. I'll uh, move to 208 608 8565. Again, 208 608 8565. Would you like to comment? Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, this is Sean Overmeyer. I'm actually on the call for the 2212 Warren Wagon Road, so I'm not here to comment on this particular okay. meeting item. Well, all right, great. Well, we'll have you down. And we'll bring you back up for that one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we have uh, 208 249 4941. They're gone. And then you have this big long number as a guest. But it's, they're gone. I don't know what that was. Okay. Anybody else online or on the phone that would like to comment regarding this application? All right. Let's see. What we got here. Now we got all kinds of design review. Um, Let's see, 2307 is no. We have Stacy Cousy. Like to comment? Yeah, so you can refer if you give a name and address. Again, just remember three minutes. Talk to me. Um, my name is Stacy Cousy. I live at 128 West Lake Fork Road. Um, so I have just a couple concerns about this project, and I think the number one concern I have is public safety. Um, I just feel as though there's no sidewalks on that side of the road, and there's no proposed um, plan to put sidewalks along the, the planned property. Um, I'm just concerned that people aren't going to see the crosswalk in front of the yacht club and they're going to try and dart across the street from say market street parking lot or albertson's and they're going to just try and like skirt their way across the street and potentially get hurt um and then i think my and i don't know if there's been any traffic studies done on that side or in that area um, and then secondly, I am concerned about the parking. 
I understand that they are exempt from parking. Um, I also understand that they're supposed to put um, signs up to direct people where to park. However, people are not going to see those signs until they're at that um, facility. And um, I just I, I feel as though with new developments and new construction going on, the city needs to hold these new developments accountable for parking, um, where parking in McCall is a big issue. And I think that's about it. Great, thank you. All right, let's see. We have uh, Jessica Harrison. Hi. Would you like to comment? I, I'm just a co owner of a lot of okay. people listening to people's concerns. And Tommy as well? Yes. Oh, you already done that? Yep. So got you there. Uh, and Allison, guessing the same thing. Uh, Andrea Huff, same thing. Emily Benton. Oh, there you You already got that. You're on here. Corey. Yes. Hi. My name is Corey Rice. I am a tenant in Market Square. I own the Christmas house at and Silver Linings Home and Gift at 136 East Lake Street. And perhaps in a very unique position because I am a tenant of the applicant and um, have to this date enjoyed a very um, professional um, constructive relationship and I would like to see that continue. Um, that being said, um, I am opposing this project strictly on the merits of the location. Um, I'm concerned about the lack of parking in that area, and I'm concerned about public safety. Uh, we do see a lot of activity in this stretch of the highway, and um, this is just going to compound that times five. I think the potential for public safety um, and people getting hurt is just goes up um, exponentially in this area. Um, I was not aware of a city mandate that requires that these types of projects be um, approved. So I'd like to know more about that, perhaps outside of my three minutes. Um, and I do also want to comment on something that um, Emily had mentioned about this project um, being a benefit to the community. I do believe that. I do wholeheartedly like the concept of a food truck court somewhere in an area um, that's similar to the Ponderosa Center, in an area that perhaps um, their customers can access them from the same side of the road, and a road that isn't a very busy state highway. <laughs> um, I would love to see something like that happen. Uh, I think they um, add tremendous value, and I support them wholeheartedly in a different location. It's just there's just too much going on with the first street construction going on um, for two years. I I would like to encourage the commission to consider some sort of a construction um, update prior to approval of this permit that um, that I think Morgan had uh, mentioned earlier that that's non-existent at this point. But I would like to see um, some sort of an update that says that that lot that people are being directed to will actually be able to be accessed that um, I think um, is very important. And um, I think that that covers most of my concerns. Again, I, um, I like the idea um, in maybe a safer area of town. So with that. Great, thank you. Right. Okay, uh, let's see. We have um, Tony Shoemaker. Yes, here. I'm just with them. Just support them. So then I'm guessing Steve Shoemaker, the same <laughs> thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Shoemaker. I own Sticky Rice. Um, I agree with your guys' concerns on the parking and the public safety. Um, I was in the unique situation to be there all summer 
and watch how everything plays out on that corner. Um, people heading east on Highway 55 have the dumpster, and then all of a sudden, bam, there's people out behind the book dumpster that want to cross right there. Um, and people coming out of First Street down there onto the highway going left. As we know, left turns and McCall are kind of a pain, right? Um, so I was watching and thinking, and so I've kind of got a solution maybe for the parking and for the public safety, and that would be to not have the crosswalk on the Manchester side of that street right there. And we have it come off uh, marketplace, have the crosswalk come off there where it's parallel to the road. And I say that you do not need to be able to turn left. So we keep it two way traffic, everything from Lenora this way. And then there is only a one lane exit out onto Main where you can only turn right. By doing that and moving the crosswalk and having the one lane, now we can have on street parking all the way up along marketplace toward the uh, parking lot here. So there would be, you'd have that whole two lanes. So now that other lane where people could turn off the highway onto first, they cannot turn right there anymore. It's only a one lane outlet. And that frees up that whole other lane in front of marketplace for on street parking. Um, and we change the crosswalk so people are more visible because they do pop out from behind that dumpster there on Yacht Club. I'm sure you guys know um, if you've driven here at all. Um, and then just to kind of reiterate on what Emily said about the parking. That is a city, definitely a city problem. Um, that's kind of what happens when you have a tourist town. The population balloons, you know, depending on what's going on. Um, so I don't necessarily see that as a specific problem for this project. It's it's a bigger issue than that. Um, that's all I have to say. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I think it's Eric. Oh wait, sorry, wrong, wrong application. Uh, Lindsay. Can't read the last name at Adam Circle. Or Linda, excuse me, Linda. We thought that was a sign in sheet, so everybody that. Oh, okay. So yeah. 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 All right. Um, go to Peter, that's the same thing. Okay. Uh, what's your name, sir? Peter Vigora, 14 to 11 Adam Circle. Okay, I got you here. Yep, you were next. I have uh, keep me in stitches in on one thirty six six East Lake Street Market Square. Now we've been there for twenty seven years, and no matter what, you can have all the signs in the world, people are still going to come and park in that parking lot. You can't just tell them, oh, you're going to get towed or whatever. They start yelling at you. You have that sign right there on the corner. It says public parking. He thinks our place is public parking. I <laughs> mean. Constantly, okay. You got people when they had we're working on the roof at Albertsons. They came, the workers came over there and started parking in our parking lot. You know, I mean, it's a small parking lot. We have customers. If we don't get our customers, we're out of business. And that's not fair. You know, they say, well, well, we can get another customer, another tenant in there. But if we're losing business, that tenant's going to find out that they're not going to be able to have any business because nobody. Once can get in there because all these people are parking there. I mean, you look at down that Chiquita's down there off of Highway 55. They have a parking spot over there. You know, I mean, and you guys are going to tear up this whole street. You know, you're not even considering doing half the street and then have access to that parking lot and then do the other half, you know, half and half, just like they do the roads and the highways. It's not, you know, it's not fair. And then Mr. Shoemaker now wants you to make, not be able to make a left turn. I mean, you know, I mean, we've been making left turns there forever. No, all because you want a, a food court. I mean, I'm all for the food court. I like food. I go, you know, winter carnival. I love to go walking down there and getting all the food. But, you know, and the, another thing is like the health department. Is Are, are they going to come and make sure that these people are, you know, running these food trucks? 
are you doing the right thing? And, you know, are they going to check them out? You know, and then that dumpster situation, the guy with the dumpster, now you're telling them to move that dumpster. Where's he going to put it? And is he going to have access to it? So, you know, maybe there should be a shared dumpster or something there. I don't know, but I think that the parking situation gets bad. It's been bad for 27 years. People go to the Hoyot Club, they get drunk, they leave their cars. You know, it's people don't care. They're going to do what they want to do, no matter what the signage says, no matter what. And that's the that's the fact, okay? They've been doing it for 20, as far as I can tell, 27 years. So that's all I got to say is that the parking is the main issue. And if you can't access that parking behind us, you can't have them parked down there where, where you guys told Maverick they can't build a Maverick. You know, they're not going to let you park over there out of spite, probably. So, you know, I just, parking is an issue. You know, you have that one parking spot over there by my father's place. That's public parking. Everything else is on the street. That's all time limited. I mean, Stacy herself, she has so many people parking and, you know, she has her little business. She has her own little parking lot. She owns her own business. You know, Harrison's don't own that building that she's in. She owns that building. And, you know, she has a right to her parking spots. Anyway, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Boy, you couldn't have done that any better. <laughs> um, Renee Silvis. Good evening. Thank you. I'm Renee Silvis. I live at 147 East Lake Street, which is adjacent to the, 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 the property where the development is being proposed. I just want to echo what's exactly what Stacy said and exactly what Corey said about parking and safety. Um, we definitely saw this last summer where the driveway and the easement was were often blocked by vehicles. Um, to Mr. Shoemaker's point, I appreciate the creativity being expressed and in, in the city perhaps thinking of some creative solutions with parking. Um, I hear the, um, the opposition to the left-hand turn idea and I just wanna encourage the city to think of some creative um, ideas for parking and traffic. It seems like um, that's definitely on the agenda. And if this project is approved, um, I would ask that, that the developers create some guidelines for the tenants. Um, you know, when you have a neighbor, it's usually either residential and you kind of know what to expect from your neighbors, or it's a, a business and you know what to expect, kind of behaviors to expect. This particular development is like camping in a way where the food truck trucks are sort of, it's not that they're temporary, but there's like a feeling of, of it being camping. So it could be that someone's laundry is hanging along the fence. It could be that someone's sitting in a lounge chair back under the trees, smoking and reading their newspaper and they've got the radio going and you, <laughs> you might remember this from last summer. So I would just ask that there would be some guidelines for the tenants to sort of contain the activity and energy of the area so that it, it respects the, the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, see Shane the belly. If I'm saying that last name right, but Shane from 20, let's see 2306. Yeah. Shane the belly, the belly, the belly, yeah. D Beloy. Oh. No, I'm not here to comment on that. Oh. Okay. Um, Brian. The law desire. Brand or branded. Yeah, Brandon Coleman. Brandon. Oh. My name is Brandon Colglazier. Uh, I live at 410 South Third Street, across from a food truck in McCall. Um, and I'm in, in support of this. Uh, I do believe that there are concerns mainly around public safety and parking. Uh, it sounds like parking's been an issue for 27 years in that parking lot prior to having food trucks out there. Um, and it is something that um, is being worked on. Uh, I do work for the owners of the proposed lot. Um, and we are getting new signage from Rocky Mountain Signs 
brighter signs, simple signs that say customer parking only for Market Square. Um, so addressing parking is a broader issue. It's being echoed. Um, and public safety, I would just like to say, I haven't been here for 27 years, but when I drive through downtown on a busy weekend, I'm going about five miles an hour and I stop about 10 times to let people cross the road. It's just something we deal with here in McCall. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, not sure if we're here to speak about this, but Ryan Colleran? Uh, just listen. Just listen. Okay. Uh, Dan. Dan Prong, 211 East Lake Street for residents at 906 Ann. Um, echo a lot of what Stacy said, the parking issues. Um, I would tell you it's not been 27 years, but the 45 years that I've been here, it's been here that long. <laughs> and down the road so far, and I am, and just like the gentleman here said, you can put up signs all you want. People don't read them or they don't want to obey them. I've got six or seven signs in our parking lot, and I'm still the bad guy when somebody parks there and wants to go somewhere else. Heard all the stories, only going to be a minute. There's a car still parked down there that was there from last night. So we're going to say that somebody else is going to enforce this, and yet that's the city. The city has one code enforcement lady. Nice lady, but she can't do all this. So reality needs to land on a few people also. So parking has been covered um, yeah. more than once. I'm confused as to why there are two entrances to the property when in the CBD district, I've always been told that you get one. We were allowed one. We closed off that parking area to control it. Um, Albertsons is uh, historic in that it's always had two going back to Paul's, but everybody else has been cut down to one. So that part's confusing to me. I do not understand um, the lady that explained there were amendments made and in 45 years, sorry, but being in the CBD the whole time, I've never been informed of what amendments were recently changed. So I'd like to hear about those. Um, the one entrance at the intersection, it's the most ill-designed intersection we have in the city. There is more confusion to drivers for the safety issue of watching where pedestrians are coming from. Um, more signs is not going to solve that. They do cross wherever they decide they want to. Wherever there's a curb cut, they're still crossing the street. If you look at 2nd Street at the Chevron station, the curb cuts allow them to go or give the indication that all of those are crosswalks. City removed them but that's not what the pedestrian does. So that much confusion in an intersection with poor alignment is a safety issue. Um, one is a business comment, I guess. I think it's interesting that the city seems to want to promote or accept the idea of temporary businesses, um, which I would see as a detriment to the other locals that are here in bricks and mortar and supporting and hiring people year round. Doesn't necessarily fall with you guys, I guess, to decide that. Um, the temporary porta potties in a scenic and shoreline environs, I, I don't understand how that even comes into a discussion in a review. Um, you can shelter them, whatever you think. It's still a porta potty. Um, it's contained, you know, just like everybody talks about the dumpster out in front now. Sure, it looked pretty decent the first year. Looks like a dumpster from then on. So it's not something that is hidden that well. Um, the parking, the other is, I don't understand why the other developments that have done anything are required to put in sidewalks. The discussion here around safety, and there's, there's no plan to even put one in. The rest of us in the CBD not only have one, we're required to maintain it. So why this isn't a requirement of this project is beyond me because you're creating a serious safety hazard. People will walk on that side of the street. They do now. They're right along the side of the fog line. A truck with mirrors could take them out, but we aren't going to improve that when we have this chance. The drainage part, I know where the water flows. I'm the guy downhill. 
I put in a storm drain to handle some of that so that my basement didn't flood anymore. This thinking that it's all going to run straight back to the lake, go run some grades on it. Comes right from that intersection and flows east. So thank you. I agree with the rest of the points. All right, thank you. Ryan, is there anybody outside? I know John Barth was here. I saw him walk outside and run across the street. Oh, the look. We're looking for John. Is there anybody else here in the audience that would like to speak that I haven't called your name? I don't see anybody out there. Oh, Eddie, take off. All right, well. Can you speak if we didn't sign up? Yes, if anybody else would like to speak, feel free. Just an address, sir. You left, Rob. You left. Uh, my name is Pat Allen. I'm 650 Stockton. I also own Pat's Glass, which is 301 railroads, a little bit of ways from that, but I was on PNZ when we approved the Maverick years ago. One thing I don't think that you're considering here <laughs> is delivery trucks. And that comes co-inspires co with the sidewalks and stuff, because if you notice like Cisco, Pepsi, Coors, whatever, they're not going to park clear down over here to deliver. They're going to park right here to deliver, and I just wanted to address that. We made a main, we made a huge mistake with Maverick <clears throat> because we didn't allow for a delivery truck, and now it's impacting my business because of all the, the big semis coming in. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think we got everybody here. Anybody else online or on the phone that would like to comment regarding this application? If you're muted, you might need to hit star six and it takes a few seconds. All right, uh, hearing none, we will close the public comments. All right. Um, Staff, is there any comments that you'd like to make regarding some of the uh, comments? Huh? Applicant. Oh, that's right. That's right. Applicant, would you, uh, Emily, would like to? Shoot, wait. I oh. forgot to read this one into the record. Oh, wait, we got one. Reopen, reopen, reopen the public. Yes. yes. Um, this is from Ryan Clark. I don't have an address, so I'll have to verify that. Um, planning and zoning, this email is in regard to the current application for a food truck coach from town McCall. As an active participant and advocate in the business and real estate development of McCall, I highly recommend approval of small food truck court in the proposed location. Mine and my business, business partners, McCall ownership and involvement include McCall Lake Cruises, Scandia Inn, Nordic Inn, Furcrest Plaza, Local property management, local housing for single family home construction and subdivision development through Medine Homes. Food trucks and the culture that come with the atmosphere are highly beneficial to the local area, its residents and businesses. I believe that it provides unity, cultural awareness and promotes increased activity within the community. Some of the best conversations are shared over food exclamation point. Since 2008, the food truck industry industry has grown to over $2 billion industry in and of itself. The growth of this model will undoubtedly continue. One example of the positive influence of influence of food truck culture can provide is quoted below. Quote, moreover, in Seattle's thriving culinary scene, restaurants have seen 16% growth, even with the influx of food trucks in the area, suggesting food trucks may bolster the restaurant industry in a city or at least they don't hurt neighboring food establishments. And there's a link, unquote. Um, as the owner of the business directly next door, McCall Lake Cruises, I am confident that the final product will be beneficial to the community, appealing to the eye and continue right along with the larger community and city goals of McCall and its residents. I am also willing as a local red resident to do all that I can to ensure that outcome. Thank you, Ryan Park. All right. There's one more. There's one. Yes. one more letter. I can just read it about it. Uh -huh. Hi, Brian. Exclamation point. Reaching out to share public comment in support of the food truck park in downtown McCall. When my parents were in town to visit the past September, the ability to take them out to lunch at the Sticky Rice food truck didn't mean 
we weren't enthusiastically patronizing, patronizing local restaurants while they visited, including Stacey Cakes, North Fork, and a special anniversary dinner at Rupert's, just to name a few. It simply meant that instead of cutting my mom's downtown shopping spree short in order to make lunch at home one day, they were one day they were here. We all enjoyed eating together at the location of the proposed food truck park and revitalized by some fried rice. My mom continued merrily walking into every single storefront in the downtown area. Food trucks in one centralized location in the downtown area will draw people to McCall and make them excited to visit. It's a simple premise that works every single year for a variety of special events and weekend or week long festivities. And it's difficult to argue that more people being excited to visit McCall and or at least giving them more reasons to be excited would be bad for businesses and the community as a whole. Donning another hat now to express additional support for exactly this sort of project. As one of the co-founders and co-owners of McCall Made, I can tell you without hesitation that as a collective group of local makers and local small business owners, we would be thrilled about a food truck park being so nearby. As grateful as we are that it's hopefully happening now, we would have been happier still had this project been able to come to fruition when we first opened McCall Made back in 2021. Quote, community over competition, unquote, is McCall Made's motto, and it's what McCall needs now more than ever. More and sustained foot traffic will be good for every single business downtown and beyond, a chance for both locals and visitors alike to support family-run food trucks and enjoy a variety of culinary options not otherwise found in McCall, all while increasing the visibility of McCall as a dynamic tourist destination and locals friendly mountain town. It feels like a very obvious, very obvious win, win to me, and I know I'm not alone. Everyone I've spoken to about this project has been tangibly excited. Sincerely and still with a great deal of hope for the future of our beloved mountain town, Carrie Stebbins of McCall Made, and we'll leave her addresses on Thompson Avenue. Okay. Um, Barrister Stephanie, was there a letter submitted from John Barr? I came before three o'clock. Oh, we already sent it out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. One last call. Anybody here or online or on the phone would like to comment regarding this application? All right. We will now close the public comment. Emily, would you like to come up? Thank you everyone for your comments. It is so encouraging to hear everyone so involved and invested in our community. I appreciate you all spending your evening here and caring about our downtown. Um, I too care about our downtown and I want this to be a successful project. Um, we've spent a lot of time working with staff since this application has gone through and all of the various agencies. We've changed the site and improved it. Um, but we are held to the confines of our site. There is very little that we can do as a development outside of the boundaries of the property. We would love to do more and we want to be a part of the urban fabric as much as we possibly can. But please review this application based on the site that we are given, based on the code, based on the compliance. That's all I have. I just have one more note that um, based on the comment about deliveries, um, because these are food trucks, they are not going to be getting any large semi deliveries. They're able to store everything that they need within their trucks um, and deliver it with smaller vehicles. So. Um, quick question. You it was noted about two entrances. And I know the one on the updated plan is just specifically pedestrian. So is that going to be. Obviously, just pedestrian are not going to have anything for deli obvious delivery or the trucks going in and out. They'll all have to come out of that south or the west end. ITD comments. Um, we are going to have a permitted the existing driveway uh, is a non permitted driveway. Um, and so we received uh, the encroachment permit from ITD. Um, this is shown to their standards with 20 feet wide and a 20 foot radius. Um, and we are just getting the one vehicle access point off of the highway, um, and that will be fully to their standards. The other one, those bollards are intended to be permanently fixed, so it will also protect protect, protect pedestrians. Okay. Um, oh, and one last thing. Um, the, the grasses that we intend to grow in those planters, um, we have some amazing native grasses that get four plus feet tall. Um, you see them all out in the fields, and so we're intending to be both two to three feet up within the planter and then an additional four feet of grasses. So that'll actually provide 
five to seven feet of screening. Okay. Um, commissioners, any other questions right now for Emily while we have her up here? I have a oh. quick question. Um, I was wondering if you've given any thought about the guidelines for tenants um, and hours of operations and, and how you were going to manage that. Uh, Tommy, do you know hours of operation guidelines? I know you've gone through quite a bit of um, tenant agreement conditions. Yeah, do I, should I come up there or can I just follow her out? Uh, yeah, we can do up there. Thank you. So to my understanding, because I had the same question, I was told that that is something that the city will will add language to the essentially it's going to be on the food truck permits that they get from the city. They will be allowed to operate a certain amount of hours during the day and we'll just abide by whatever the city says they however long they can be there. So if the city says 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. AP, whatever that is, that will be our official open and close. I don't know if that's accurate. I'm not, I'm not familiar with food truck vendor permits, but that that's my understanding. And we're open to we don't have set hours right now. We're we're open to whatever we can adjust. Whatever the city wants. So not not late night, it just it'll be on the, the vendor permit specifically, not the vendor court permit, um, but Again, we've been working closely with staff and we are very happy to continue to do so on if it needs to be in the the owner agreement with the vendors or if that can be handled in the individual permits. Um, on the screening for the dumpster and the porta parties, are they going to be totally screened from any possible view from the road? Yeah, it kind of shows a little bit on there, but I yes, that is the intention that um, it will be a solid fence of a decorative nature that you're not seeing anything. Uh, it would be a gate along the front so that the truck has access. Um, but again, that gate should be and will be a solid. Non permeable. And with a dumpster, it's got to be a bear proof. You know, Absolutely. that one. Yeah, we've got that um, plan that the dumpster will be a bear proof container. OK, but the fence and screening will be totally. I mean, more for the porta potties, obviously with the I'm sure as well, but the porta potty has to be high enough that nobody's going to see the crown of it. I mean, and does that affect city code as far as height of anything like that screening? Uh, you know, as an enclosure rather than a fence. It's yeah, it's not okay. So it's not considered okay. Okay, uh, did, commissioners. I think we have something else. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah, I was just going to ask. Did you give any thought to more of a permanent kind of bathroom? Uh, building, I guess, to you know, completely hide the porta potties or or go to just a more typical you know toilet. Uh, that's not the direction we wanted to go on this project, as it's intended to be two to five years until they do come back with a permanent development. Um, so, due to the short term nature of the project, it just wasn't financially reasonable um, to make the bottom line work for the project as a whole. And then we would have also had to go through sewer permitting. Um, and as of now, we're not not connecting to the sewer. I want to keep everything fully contained, fully temporary, as minimal impact to the site as we can. Liz, did you have a question? I think you were. Uh, yeah, it was the same as Commissioner Kinzer's question about the guidelines. Okay. So. When you is your intention to make this a permanent type of building and have an actual building down I, the road? Yes, sir. That's the intention. So at that don't point, have, don't know what that looks like yet. I mean, at all. But at that point, you'd have to address parking, sidewalks, and everything I'm, else, I'm, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing. Well, I mean, that'd be a whole different. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll get a jump on it if you just do it now. <laughs> the idea is that it would be a very different type of development, probably a very different use, and we would absolutely go through full engineering, traffic impact, all of that for a permanent development. Tony, did you have any questions for 
Applicant? Muting. So I have another I have another okay. question, given the last few comments. Um, I mean, as it as it is now, it seems very temporary to me, and I understand kind of the the reasons, the financial reasons why you don't want to invest in some other infrastructure. Is it not your plan to continue a food court on this property, um, you know, five years down the road? Is this just a, a short term kind of plan to use the property for the next five years? Like, what are your. I guess longer term thoughts. Yes, sir. That's correct. I don't. Again, I can't tell you what we're gonna. I don't know what we're gonna do with it. But our plan is to not. This will not be a permanent food truck lot in ten years. I don't think. As of right now, that's that's what we're thinking. And so, in our agreements with the city, we yeah. talked about if this were to continue past the five years, that we would go through a permanent vendor court permitting process that this is truly temporary until they decide what they want to develop on their lot. Um, and in order to, again, fill in the vacant urban urban fabric with something that's an asset to our community, asset to their business. Um, Does a permanent food court get differently permitted than a temporary food court? We would generally permit it the same. It would probably go through additional sewer permitting and things like that for hookups and bathrooms and so on. Um, probably each requires sidewalk insulation based on the scale of the project. Brian, is there any public bathrooms nearby? I'm not thinking of any at the moment. The, uh, that our city public Air bathrooms? Park. Art Roberts Park. Art Roberts, yeah. At Art Roberts Park, okay. Uh, Tony. If you want to comment, you're, I think you're muted. You might want to hit star six. And if you have any questions. Well, Chairman Lyons, do you guys want to close the public hearing? I'm not sure if you did that. Uh, yeah, I closed it. Okay. Okay. I think that's it unless Tony shows back up. But <laughs> All right. Um, commissioners, comments, any questions for staff? Comments in general, thoughts? I guess I got a question for Brian and staff is, you know, could you speak to the requirements of the sidewalk in the driveway ent entrances and, and how that lays out for, you know, this type of project versus a more um, brick and mortar type project. Yes, uh, the driveway entrances is fairly straightforward. They are proposing one vehicle driveway and that is um, really only more of a loading zone type of a use than a driveway where the general public, anybody can turn in and out of there anytime they want. Um, the other is a pedestrian access point um, rather than vehicle driveway. Um, and then the sidewalk, uh, it is generally required in Central Business District to install a curb gutter and sidewalk. Uh, if the commission determines that it is not proportional to the development, it can be waived. Is that why it's not in here now? Because basically they're not, yeah. And you wouldn't know where the entrance is going to be for something in the future. So that would be tough to do and then cut out part of it. Um, I know city public works obviously paints the parking spots and crosswalks. For whatever reason always seems way late in the summer by the time they get that done. Um, if this is approved, would it be something we'd be able to have the applicant have at least that crosswalk highly painted prior to operation? Just if this, I mean, I don't know, because I know it's public works, but I mean, if they're open in that, because that right now you can't tell there's a crosswalk there unless, you know, and so. Um, so the striping efforts, it's all web dependent yeah. um, and contractor availability um, and when we fit into that. So it does vary by year, but we do try to get it in June, have all the streets striped. Um, but then, of course, if it rains or if it's too cold, we can't stripe it when we want to. Um, there are the green flags at this location, but like everyone has said, you can't direct people very well or to read signs as well. Um, 
And I know there was a comment about putting an additional crosswalk on the west side of First Street to cross. Um, we're not in favor of that right now because you would be blocked by the building. Um, it's a line of sight issue. You would really need a signal there to have the four cross the crosswalks in four directions, um, which has a trickling effect traffic wise and requires a lot more studies and cooperation with ITD. Um, so yeah, it will get striped, but it's very weather dependent and contractor availability dependent. City does some of it themselves as far as <clears throat> yeah, we do the side streets um, and then we work with ITD on striping Lake Street and 3rd Street since it's their right of way. Could staff or, or at least do like some highlights on there if it's not. I mean, I know it's weather dependent, but if they don't have the other contract ready to go, because it always seems pretty late. I watch it every year for my office and it's typically later. I mean, it's end of June and I'm just thinking anything there just to highlight that, even if it's not the final permanent one. just if possible. I'm not sure what their schedules look like. There's yeah, okay. Well, just some projects can happening talk with. I think that would yeah. be helpful. Um, and Brian, there were some questions regarding changes of the that zone. What is there anything? I can't remember what. So there was a general code amendment yeah. uh, that provides some permitting standards for temporary uses such as drug courts. Um, I thought that was what was being recorded. Okay. Is there a way? I mean, I know the so the current conditional use permit the application is for five years, correct? It's a design review. Our design reviews last for the five years. Um, that was my proposed timeline. The bill should be shorter or longer. So, is there a way to potentially do it shorter to make sure everything works the way it's supposed to, and there isn't really any yeah. major issues? The current conditional approval is. Uh, this library will expire after five years uh, and can be extended administratively for an additional two years. Um, the temporary nature of this allows a lot of flexibility in identifying problems once they are up and running. Um, so I think it may be prudent to do a one year uh, approval and then make administrative adjustments from there. Well, they're going to put several improvements in, so I don't know, one year, but I could see a two year yeah. kind of work the bugs out of the first year type thing. And then your second year, if you don't have it fixed, yeah. especially with affects some of the parking. I mean, obviously, parking is going to be an issue, it always has been. Sidewalks downtown have taken away with a lot of the parking. And so we're just, it's parking. Your condition of approval two talks about proof of adequate, adequate yeah, sewer permitting. Situation. This for the guy, so it's supported by public hearings. Sorry, just I just was wondering. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, David. Sorry. Condition approval to provide proof of adequate sewer permitting. Is that if there's no sewer service required? Again, a very easy condition approval. Great. And I know the health department will require their own inspections for each truck. And everything just like the one out of town, they got to take care of their own wastewater. Um, I saw a comment about the, uh, the sewer district asked about the grease traps and stuff, but that's going to have to be all taken care of for each individual based on their their individual application for a right, for permit. permit. Okay. All right, commissioners, any other questions for staff? Not necessarily for staff. I guess I just got a general comment that I think uh, Chairman Lyons, your suggestion of reducing the five year term down to you know a shorter time frame to kind of test it out seems like a good suggestion. Yeah, I mean, if we move forward with it, I could see you know, one year seems a little short because they are going to do some improvements and there's going to be some costs. Two years we give them time to do that if there's any issues with it the city code enforcement or staff could you know, address that they could give them a chance to make adjustments and then beyond the two years it would be up to an administrative approval to give them any more time again that's how i wrote the condition oh that's how you wrote if you guys want 
by having to revisit commission level of that review, you can say that. Well, I mean, we can do that, but I think you would know if there's you're going to get the phone calls, not us. Correct. So, <laughs> and it does appear to have you know enough driveway access to come in and have the honey dippers come in and clean the thing and have the dumpster to come in and be. Now, and I don't have much. I guess there's maybe room for. I guess they'll probably back in. <laughs> That'll be fun for them, but they'll have to figure that out with the seating and and staff will be on that to make sure those trucks have in and out egress off that one entrance safely and with room to turn around if they need to. Um, but I, I do, I mean, if we are going to move forward, I, I, I'm thinking that two year makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah, I agree with the, the two year and then following up with an extension with administrative approval following that. I guess a couple other comments. I I would really appreciate um, some more kind of landscape screening, some natural kind of vegetation screening around the gray water tanks and the dumpster and the toilets to make sure that they really are blocked from from views. Um, looking at the site map that's online right now or on the screen, it looks like you know at least from the road you would still see the dumpster. Yeah, um, and I would like to see, I mean, I think we've got condition approval with the signs, but I definitely would like staff to review the signs that they're be doing. Um, we have to, do they have to get any ITD approvals with the signage along that because the highway or can staff? And as far as their sign or size requirements that or limitations. Compared to the signs are. Um, I don't necessarily need to know them other than just make sure staff if we can get the best signage without being too crazy with signs and. Um, and I mean, I was just thinking too is the on the. Uh, inside the fog line there between that and the fence line. I know a lot of times people are cutting that corner pretty sharp, especially when the, the paints worn off. Is that area going to be striped and painted? No parking painted on the surface or just signs? It's it's not proposed right now for striped, just the signage. What staff thought as far as striping that and just saying no parking? I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to doing that within the pay portion. Um, that is also not our right of way to make decisions on. So we'd have to coordinate further with the ITD. I think that's worth at least question or discussion because that would make it real clear and nobody's just going to pull up there or hope that nobody's going to pull up there in part. Any other thoughts? I appreciate it. Seem like you have something. Yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate that um, this is a private piece of property and what they are proposing is fits code, but I don't think that you can. You have a parking problem. City has a parking problem and to just come in and say. It's the city parking problem and not our parking problem is a little disingenuous, so. Um, you know, it fits code, but I don't believe that it's the right fit for the city. That's my opinion. Yeah, at this point, the central business district doesn't have requirements for parking and we unfortunately have to go by that and maybe staff would I think this is another item in discussion of the future with some that, but as I see other issues down the line, but anyway, uh, but within the central business district, they don't have that within the code, unfortunately. Yep. Ryan, so Liz. I, oh. Yeah, um, 
I, I want to kind of go back to like the guidelines or conditions, you know, the idea of somebody, you know, drying out their laundry when they're a you know, food <laughs> truck tenant in, in that space is, is concerning to me. Uh, so I was wondering if um, kind of in addition to uh, what was it condition nine, which is about the selection of outdoor furniture if the applicant could also propose um, some potential conditions that they put on the uh, food trucks that use their space to avoid things like people doing non-food truck related work in that space, um, or maybe that's part of the food truck permit, I'm not sure, but I would like that somehow addressed. Is that within the food truck it, application it gets or permit tricky, uh, leasing lease agreements because we don't generally see them um, but we can definitely put a condition of approval that no materials other than menu signs and similar can be outside of food trucks Just leave it at that okay. Any other discussion, questions, comments from commissioners? I have one we heard from um, during the public testimony about uh, drainage running to the east, I believe. I guess I'm just curious to hear from Morgan on that, and whether there is a problem there and would it would it get worse with this project or not? Um. I don't have the topography. I have the topography on our GIS and it shows most of the prop the property basically draining north to the lake. There is a lower spot that looks like it might drain the east. But it looks like I don't I wouldn't anticipate an increase in runoff since this is all just gravel. And there's vegetation along the property lines that would capture that runoff before going to the neighboring properties. So I wouldn't anticipate it to get worse. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Commissioners, anybody interested in doing a motion? All right, I'll take it. I move to approve DR 2306 and SR 2305 with the staff recommended conditions of approval with the following modifications uh, to condition number three, um, add landscape screening around the obscuring enclosures. Uh, oh, hold on, Liz, we got a question from Meredith. Do you want them to be um, permanent plantings? Well, I don't know, Ryan. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> this, is your, this is your suggestion. So. Well, well, she just well, Meredith just threw me for a loop. Um, I I don't think they necessarily need to be permanent plantings. I guess what I was thinking of was. You know, I, I appreciate there's going to be screening with the with the fence and it's going to look really nice and everything, but still you're going to know what's behind it. Uh, I think it should be blocked off with some sort of landscape vegetation that kind of breaks that up. So it doesn't necessarily need to be permanent. Hurry on. Okay, so yeah, so that updates to condition number three, um, and then we also wanted to update condition number eight the timeline with uh, a two year approval and followed by, uh, what do we say? Another three year administrative extension opportunity. Do we want to extend that even longer? Cause you know, originally it was five plus two. So do we want to equal seven total? I, in my opinion, I think the two and, and three makes sense to just be kind of capped at five. All right, so be it two years of approval with a uh, opportunity to extend for another three years by administrative extension. Uh, 
and then I don't know if we want to add this to a condition or make a new condition, but the whole um, food truck activity avoiding hanging things that are laundry like condition. I don't know exactly how to say that. And do we want to add hours of operation or is Brian, do you know if that's part of the permit? Is food truck permit? Looking through the vendor permit requirements, I didn't see anything. I didn't read very closely at it um, on hours operation. Um, if you guys want to do that, I would recommend doing it at this. You okay adding that too, Liz? Yes. So yeah, so limit activity within you know set hours of operation and uh, I don't know, limit activity that is not food truck related or something to that effect. Right, I believe we have a motion then. <laughs> I don't know if we, do we need to, or Bill, do you think we need to restate that? I think this guy, they would. If, if Meredith has a clear record and the commissioners also have a clear understanding of the motion, that's great. Um, I can tell you as somebody that's just sort of listening in, it's not super clear what the motion was. So um, I would suggest maybe that <clears throat> If Meredith has good notes, she could read those out. And then I think it was Commissioner Rock could confirm that that was her intended motion and say so moved. I think Meredith always has great notes. So that's a very good idea. So let's go with that. Um, Commissioner Rock has a motion to approve with the following modifications. Modify condition number three to add additional either temporary or permanent landscape screening to the landscaping plan. Uh, modify condition number eight to indicate a two year approval timeline with the opportunity to extend for an additional three years via administrative approval. Add the condition of no encroachments or unsuitable uses not related to the conduct of a food vendor court. Add hours of operation as set by the office of the city clerk. So moved. <laughs> second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Brian, can you do a roll call vote? Uh, Commissioner Rock. Aye. Commissioner Kinzer? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Petty? No. Commissioner Moss? Yeah. I think that was a yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Good piece. Okay. Motion has been approved. Did you Commissioner Lyons vote? Yes. Oh, we did? Okay. All right, uh, commissioners, do you need a well? I know we're trying to hurry up. Anybody here, Dave, Dave, do you need a break or anything? We're good. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to Zion Review 2307, Shoreline 2302, and Scenic Route 2304 for 1870 Warren Wagon Road. Gad, Gerhardt, and Mike Southwick. Smith. Mike Smith, I'm sorry. Wick. Smithwick. Um, who would like to come up? Oh, he's on his way. Yeah, thank you for your time. I'm uh, Corey Barnes with Pivot North Architecture, uh, the designer on the project. Um, so I'm here to kind of review the proposed project on the 1871 wagon. Um, so the proposed home, this is the, the concept site plan here. You can see the footprint in the home. Um, I, I would just want to say thank you to the staff. Uh, they have been very helpful. Um, we've we've delegated a lot of tasks to them to sort of sure up what our design intent would be um, to make sure that we're meeting all codes, all guidelines for lot size calculations, building heights. Um, Brian probably got annoyed with me countless times because I kept peppering him with questions. So I do appreciate your guys' effort on that. Um, I think we have met and exceeded all of those code requirements. Um, we went through the code calculations as noted here, provided by the city of um, and are under all of those calculation. Um, the height we also studied in depth to make sure that the building height was 
within the parameters that were required by code. Um, and those sections are provided in this document. Uh, I can't remember what page number. Um, uh, no, next one. Sorry. So as you can see in these in these diagrams, we've we've really studied this. To make sure that we're not impacting any of the type restrictions. Um, we've we done the floor plan. We've reworked some things that there were some initial questions on initially, um, and those have been rectified to to meet what was requested of us. Go. As far as the site goes, um, like I said, we did the lockout coverage. Um, we've indicated some diagrams as it relates to the adjacent properties where the house positioning will be basically here. And our goal was to try and not impede anybody's views or corridors, try and maintain sort of this, the, the law as it is. Um, there is an existing cabin that extends out into the current high water Mark setback. We are abiding by that, pushing the house back so that we're not in it. Um, a survey was done and we've based everything off of that survey. Um, setbacks were determined based on our lot calcs, our building width. Again, ran through Brian extensively to make sure that we were on the right track there. Um, and then that dictated our building heights. We can go to the next. The next one, please. Uh, as far as the site goes, uh, we want to preserve as much of the natural landscape as possible. Um, the large trees that are on the site uh, will be preserved as a screening element along the lakefront. Um, we don't want to expose the whole house, but the trees that uh, will be preserved are noted on this plan. Natural vegetation elsewhere, um, as as you can see, the driveway has been modified from what its existing entrance is and pulls it away. It will be gated. Um, and then the patio calcs and everything were done per city code. Um, and then there's a small path down to the lake and, and the property dock. And then running through some of the imagery. Um, so these are proposed images for the approach off of Warren Wagon. Um, and then the view coming down the driveway as the house kind of nestles into the hillside. Um, the front elevation, as you can see, we've tried to really integrate it into the natural slope of the site so the building does not appear larger. Um, and so everything that's kind of to the north is very minimal as far as what's exposed from the house. Uh, looking up from the lake, kind of the views, these would be the presumed trees that are being kept from the from the lake front side. Okay. Uh, just another shot kind of from the south east corner of the lot. Get to the next one. Um, and then a shot from the lake, as you can see, trying to preserve those those nice trees out next to the lake. Uh, this would be the proposed view from the north side of the property. Um, like I said, we tried to integrate it into the site as much as possible to limit that exposure to the adjacent lot. Uh, and then these are just the, the, the floor plans. So it's a three level house, uh, a sunken basement uh, that is really not visible from any direction except the east side from the lake. Um, and then the basement patio, which is primarily covered, um, I'd say 80% coverage by the patio above. And then the, the it trickles down the hillside down to the shoreline. Uh, again, the main floor, primary entry, upper decks, all of which have been vetted by the calcs. And then the upper floor above the garage, um, that is, is just additional rooms. Uh, the proposed roof takes advantage of some low slope convex curved roofs. Uh, the intent is to hold the snow. Um, and then the runoff is is. Really gradual, no steep slopes. Um, most of the roofs are actually all of the roofs are 
low slope um, with a number of convex curved roofs. In the front. Uh, and then these are for some um, elevation images, kind of just to give an idea. The primary use of material on the building will be a wood siding cladding product vertically, um, and then some some stone, and then a mix of some steel uh, elements, a lot of wood timber, um, and then some accent with some big large windows. Again, the north and then the south view. Same materials, pretty simple. Uh, and then back to the sections. So that is all. Hey, uh, commissioners, any questions? Have you got snow storage figured out? Uh, not at this time. I think we understood that would be part of the building permit and we would direct the snow storage as part of that. I believe it was a condition. They have that. I'll talk with Brian on that one. Any other questions before we go to staff report? Nothing for me. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And Ryan, staff report. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, this application uh, for a roughly 8,000 square foot single family residence. Uh, there is, there was an existing home on site and a small outbuilt or a accessory house. Of, I don't know if actually a kitchen and all that, uh, but right along the lake, partially in the neighbor's property, uh, both have been demolished. Uh, so you've been seeing construction activity on this property as you're driving by. Uh, that's what's going on. It's they're not it's already gone. Uh, yeah, so generally uh, they've done a very careful job of meeting all of our dimensional requirements. Uh, again, it's another project that touches on basically all of them setbacks, building height, uh, two to one. There is a small portion of the roof that uh, Looks like it's maybe encroaching just a touch. Uh, it's also a little hard to tell based on the site topography and how the building's moving with that. Uh, but there's a condition of approval to rectify that. Um, snow storage uh, it is a fairly large lot. There appears to be space for it. Uh, it's just it's identified on the property. Um, the landscaping requirements, uh, it's pretty heavily treed and vegetated site as is. Uh, they don't have any shrubs identified off the scenic route frontage at this time, although they're probably exist until you can fix that. Uh, but generally, like I said, meets the uh, code. No stand for any questions. This one I saw that there was the driveway, the, steep, the steepness of the driveway. Um, that, I mean, the picture they showed didn't sound like that, but I, this one or was it the next one? I wrote it down. Or Morgan, maybe you would have better. I did have a comment in there about the driveway um, steepness, and I just got some comments back from their engineering team today, but I haven't read through them all the way. Um, and I think they were addressing that to keep most, to keep it a little more steep to help preserve some of the trees due to the grading. Um, I'll have to look at that a little more in depth, but it is one of my comments right now. Bring the steepness of the pipe. And as normal, it's still going to have to get engineering review and approval yep. as part of it anyway. So, okay. All right. Driveways are allowed to be steeper than 10% with engineering and fire district. Okay. All right. Any questions for Brian? And I don't, before we go to Morgan for a little bit more details, if. All right, Morgan. Um, so one of my comments was the steepness of the driveway. Um, and then another comment of mine was just a few clarifications on their stormwater drainage report, um, but it looks like it'll be able to meet our standards. Um, and it's just clarifying a few items that I had, which was sent back to me today um, around three. Um, so I think they'll be able to meet our requirements I think I had some confusion on the removal sheet. It looked like there might have been some work happening on the neighboring property, but I don't know if it just 
didn't show up on the on the plans correctly, but just working through that also. And you say they've already removed or started removing them? Received their demo permit. They didn't want the house moved over to Davis Street. <laughs> <laughs> they offered to give it to us, but we didn't. Too much, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't get it up the driveway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Too steep a driveway. Okay, uh, commissioners, any questions for Morgan? All right. With that, we will go to the public hearings. We'll open the public hearing um, with the sign-in sheet kind of scattered with everybody. I'm just going to go anybody online or on the phone that would wish to comment regarding 1870 Warren Wagon. Commissioner Lyons, can I, can I make a request to the commission in advance of public uh, testimony or as the first public testimony? Um, I'm interested party Ashley Gowell, uh, next door neighbor. Well, I'd like to do online stuff and then we'll go. You can be first. Okay. That is so we can kind of keep it. I'm guessing there's not much on that. Anybody online or on the phone that wish to comment? If you're on the phone, you may need to hit star six to unmute yourself. There ain't nobody. Okay, now we'll thank you. Just begin with your name and address. Uh, my name is Ashley Gow, uh, address 1878 uh, Warren Wagon Road, the property to the north of the applicant. Um, there are th there are two. There's one note and two conditions of the uh, of the application that lead me to request a, a continuance of this hearing until we can see the plans to mitigate two of those conditions and the notes from the engineer on the third. The city engineer states that the driveway is too um, steep and lacks uh, the right amount of um, uh, area at the road. Um, the property is within 150 feet of its entire coverage on the lot, and we would like to wait as, uh, as the next door neighbors to see the plan before we then comment on the plan as it exists versus um, just having administrative approval in that particular area because we're affected by it. So we'd like to see the public hearing continued until we can actually see the plans as they're proposed to mitigate the step, steepness of the driveway and adjust it inside that really narrow range that they have to work with, 150 square feet on coverage. Uh, condition number three notes that there's no snow storage um, in the application since we are next door neighbors and since the snow storage would be on our property line, we would like to see the plan and be able to review the plan before the commission takes action so that we can make appropriate comments ahead of the plan. And again, um, we trust the uh, administrative approval process, but being that it's an intimate property line, we think that we uh, we would like to have the right to review snow storage plans and in and, and another and comment in the next public hearing or in the continued public hearing. Um, Condition number five speaks to the roof height and the setbacks, and uh, we would like to study that more carefully. It just it suggests that it needs more look. It suggests that the uh, uh, staff is going to look at it and and approve it administratively. We would uh, we would like the chance to see that particular plan, study that plan. Uh, that that condition number five suggests it is an issue, and uh, comment on that in uh, public hearing after reviewing it. So my request is that. Uh, is that the commission continue this public hearing until we see the actual plans from the architect uh, for answering that one note from the engineer and the two conditions of approval. That's my comment. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, anybody else here in the audience that would like to comment regarding this application? All right, one last call. Anybody online or on the phone that would like to comment regarding this application? All right, we will close the public hearing. Uh, applicant, would you like to comment regarding anything or respond to anything? Uh, <clears throat> John King, um, 2194. Uh, Bad Drive, and also in, in Boise as well, um, with Pivot North Architecture, uh, along with Corey. Um, I just want to address the comments. Um, like Corey said, we have uh, worked very closely with staff. We have everything in 3D. We have the model in 3D. We have the site in 3D. We have the survey. 
we can cut infinite sections of this. We are very familiar with the rules and we, from the start, said we are playing by the rules. We're not going out of the rules. So whether it's law coverage, whether it's setbacks, whether it's height, and we've made adjustments on anything that's close. I think there was a comment on one that there was some uh, concern, but it was really just the way the drawing was, and it was right here, and this is well beyond. So we clarified that. This is just an image of what's beyond. So I think we worked with Brian and staff to sort of show that that, that, is, not, that is not an issue. Um, so we'd requested it not be continued. I think we've done the homework. I think everything in here is very reasonable that staff uh, can review. It's going to go through permit review. It's going to get scrutinized. It's going through engineering. Um, so I know he says we would like to review it, but I don't know that that's a reasonable request that individuals get to stall somebody else just so they can review it. I mean, we're professionals. We've been reviewing it. You have staff members. You have professionals. There's there's checks to go through. And so I just request that it not be continued just to. I know that the neighbor's probably slightly upset that there's a project next door. I understand that we've got <clears throat> a property here. Uh, number nine on the list right next door to us. Uh, I've reviewed it. I've looked at it. You know, it's going to be been the place 38 years. It's going to be a little bit noisy. It's going to be, but we look, the submission's great. It's followed by the rules. I'm not going to try and get in the way of it. You know, it looks great. So we're in, the, I'm in personally in the same situation and it just doesn't seem fair. I'm not going to try and try and block it just because I, you know, it's going to be noisy and a little bit of a nuisance. So that would be my request. You'd be open to once you guys agree if anything new or something changes to share it with them, not sure. as a condition of approval, yeah. but make sure they're aware of what's in process. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, lots of documents. We're going to uh, generate a bunch more, you know, before we get to permanent engineering. Um, so we've got all, all the studies, landscaping, we've got civil, and we're, I mean, we've probably got months more of details and things to refine to make sure it's right. And I will say on the, you know, on the, we really try to keep the, the site natural. And I mean, snow storage is, you know, they come in with a big scooper and they and they dump it. We will find a way for where that needs to go. We've got a pretty pretty decent site. We've got uh, a long driveway. I think we'll have places to put it. Okay. Chairman Lyons, I would like to speak if it's possible. I'm sorry, we've closed the public and are hearing part of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, commissioners, questions for staff and discussion. Can you resolve the eve height? Um, yeah, dimensional. Um, I was out of the office last week. It sounds like Meredith did some work with them. Okay. The challenge with this is, yeah, we have a requirement that no building element can be twice the building or twice its height relative to the distance to the side property lines um, on a big house on a sloping lot like this that gets very complicated it's part of the slope display and measure correctly um, but yeah it sounds like that is uh, yeah they've submit a revised height study um, to clarify the angle that we're looking at on the screen um, is way further back further up slope so that um, two to one setback to height ratio line is in a different location equal to that location along the property line. Um, but we would recommend keeping whatever condition is associated with it so that all of those provisions can be required and met for the review. I walked this today. It is a steep driveway. And I guess I, I've done this a long time and I'm this is my first meeting, so I apologize, but. You should be able to figure out where you're going to put snow storage, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, John King, yes, certainly uh, we will. So we're the architects. We've got a team with, you know, civil engineer grading landscape. That's not in our scope, but we do coordinate that work and we will make sure that the snow storage gets identified and that it's all covered. I mean, we, we accept the condition that, that we need to meet it. And we'll work with staff 
And I know Brian really well, but I would just like to say you're asking not to be um, postponed, but we don't have all of the information. So in the future, maybe. Okay. Yeah, so my, my take on that is the in the process of obtaining the building permit will ensure that the applicants are in compliance and anything that is in compliance in this case we're going to have to approve right like we, we can't just kind of use our discretion to say well we don't really like that or we don't we really like this or we really don't like that like if it is in compliance with the code if it meets the standards then then we're going to approve it so um, i feel very comfortable of um, having the applicant work with the city to ensure compliance in order to obtain the building permit and going through that process. Yeah, Dave, there's quite often, there's a lot of some of the minor items that will go back to staff. Yep. It, it, it rely on staff to, yeah. Fatal flaws. And if, you know, it is my opinion that they can meet the criteria without substantially modifying their plans. I'll give it to you guys for the hearing with the conditions as you guys are not comfortable with approving those conditions and having me be the review body from that point forward, then you should continue it and get more information. And if it's drastically changed, it typically will come back to us if there's any big changes. So I, I have a quick question about the driveway, I guess, and I'm curious to hear what Brian and Morgan have to say about that. I mean, is there if we are pushing up against the um, lot coverage limit, um, are are they going to be able to handle, you know, trying to um, decrease the the slope of the driveway and and stay underneath that that requirement? Uh, so the lot coverage, they are pretty close to their maximum. Um, the lot coverage or driveways only count at 35%. Uh, so for each square foot, you have approximately three square feet to play with before you're hitting the maximum. So there's really uh, more room there than it would appear just based on the numbers itself. And the permits subject to both staff and fire department's approval, they can do it safely anyway. So one of the big ones is the fire department making sure they can have safe access, ingress, egress. Any other thoughts, questions, discussions, motions? Yep. I move to approve DR2307, um, SH2302, and SR2305 with the staff recommended conditions of approval. Second. Uh, uh, real quick, was that? SR 2304 or 2305. You mentioned 2305, but I got 2304 oh. on my note. Or my. 2304. Mm -hmm. yeah, 2305. You have 2305. I've got 2304 on 2304 my. 2304 in the agenda and it's 2305 in the potential motion listing. Mm -hmm. It's. I think it's appropriately 2304. Okay, I amend my motion to SR 2304. Thank you, Commissioner Rock. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve all in. Well, should we do a roll call? Let's do roll call. Uh, Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Petty? Yes. Commissioner Kinzer? Yes. Commissioner Rock? Yes. Commissioner Ross? Yes. All right, that's approved. Okay, thank you very much. On to um, design review 2308, shoreline 2304 at 1844 Warren Wagon Road. We have uh, Corey Snyder Bort. Oh, Luke, we have Luke. That's right. <laughs> any MDPI, but I can't keep them straight. All right, Luke. 
Hi there, uh, this is Luke Benoy with McCall Design and Planning, uh, 121 Commerce Street. Um, and I think I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully. Yeah. So can you guys see my screen yet? Yep. Yes. OK, great. Um, yeah, so this is a design review and a shorelines um, application for 1844 Warren Wagon, which is just just a few lots south. Um, to familiarize you with the area, it's right where Crescent Rim is taking off a of Warren Wagon, so we're about a mile and a quarter out Warren Wagon Road. Um, here's the existing property. Uh, there's a shared driveway. Um, with the property to the north, it enters here, um, curves around the existing garage on the Marks Troyer property, and then back out. Um, per city staff, um, the two property owners have uh, have uh, firmed that shared driveway up with the shared driveway agreement that they've signed um, since this application. Um, here are our setback calculations. We're about we're at, at about 90% of allowable with this project. Um, just under 3,500 square foot of living, a little bit of mechanical storage space, and an attached 700 foot garage. Um, kind of the same deal. Whenever we get into one of these narrow uh, lake lots, there's always topography down to the lake. Um, and dealing with the half height setback really shapes the house. And so um, I'm going to show you a, a, a couple sections similar to what you saw before on how we established that. And then we actually back check that in 3D, um, similar to what John was talking about. But um, here, this vertical line here is the 50 foot high water setback. And that is this line here on the site plan. Then we've got a 3D model of the existing topography off of the survey that we've had done, and we project that up 50 feet, or excuse me, 35 feet, and that shows us the 35 foot height limit from natural grade. Then we project up the lowest point of the structure, 35 feet, to, to show the 35 foot maximum structural height. And then at any given point in the project, we're projecting up off the property lines um, at a, a two to one angle there to show that we're meeting the half height setback. So no element can be closer than half its height to the property line. And that's what these sloped angles are showing. And so once you establish that, and it's really the first thing we do when we get one of these projects is we, we kind of build a glass box um, and we know the confines of what we can build within that on the site. Um, these folks have an existing garage that they'd like to keep here. Um, it'll eventually get recited to match this project. Here are some photos of what's there existing. Uh, there's a covered breezeway. You can see the shared driveway coming through. Here's an image from the lake. Um, this shows the existing landscaping, which is going to remain intact. It's uh, it, it's some nice stone steps and a really, I think, nicely naturally done um, some stone uh, boulder retainage, and that'll all remain. We're not proposing any new work in the fit in the 50 foot setback. Um, existing dock and beach, again, not proposing any changes to that. Some more images of the existing house. Um, here's the survey to show the existing site conditions. Uh, the existing driveway comes down and this is all just kind of gravel area. There's a fence along this property line um, and that existing driveway continues on, loops back up and ties back in here. Um, since there's an existing home on the property and since we're using the existing driveway, we're only needing to take out a few trees, which is nice. Here's our proposed landscape plan. Um, 
This shows existing trees uh, between the property to the north. Um, here's the fence line. There's some nice mature firs uh, between this and the property to the south and a spruce down here. Um, existing boulder, boulder retaining to remain. And then, uh, you know, any of the disturbed areas that'll inevitably happen um, during construction will be reseeded with native grasses, which is basically what's going on with the rest of the site right now. Uh, floor plans on something like this, it's it's obviously going to be a narrow home, and so we wanted to have a sense of opening up to that view as soon as possible. Um, so side loading the bedrooms towards the back and then opening up to uh, a nice open great room living dining concept. Uh, there's a shot of the dark sky fixtures we're going to use. And then, of course, to comply with the half height setbacks, that upper level needs to get narrower. and so. Um, that's what we've done here. We've stepped in the upper level and uh, because it's long and narrow, we're trying to create a lot of as much natural light in there as possible. So we've got a kind of a stairwell that acts as a light well as well. Um, and then daylight basement below with the rec room, uh, bunk room and a patio under the under the deck. Uh, here is a kind of an image to help you visualize how we're building that. 3D model and then establishing our side yard setbacks and then all our setbacks really in three dimensions. So we know we're staying within the confines of that. Um, this horizontal plane is the lowest point of the structure projected up 35 feet. Here I've taken the topography and projected it up 35 feet. And then each one of these little angled rods comes off of the topographic line adjacent to it or the property line to show us the half height setbacks. And so that's it kind of explains why the building can step out as it gets up um, in grade. Um, it also kind of shows you why this upper level needs to step in. Um, here are our uh, 2D elevations. Um, heights called out. A lot of, you know, a lot of glass to get natural light in and, and take advantage of the views. It's real minimal from the driveway side. Uh, north elevation, and then here are some uh, color renderings. View from the lake, uh, view from the south. Uh, we're using a little bit of natural stone, some box rib steel siding over the uh, foundation walls. As it steps down and to break up the form, uh, we're using cedar siding uh, vertically and horizontally. With a with a natural finish, almost a bit of a barnwood look, but a little more refined, uh, dark stained wood fascia and a composition asphalt roof to retain the snow. Some more renderings from angles, and of course, none of the trees are visible on these renderings, so that we're not obscuring the form, um, and then. Here's a rendering of kind of before and after from the lake view to give you an idea. And a bit of a detailed shot of what's going on with the existing landscaping that will remain. So uh, I will figure out how to stop sharing my screen here and then I'm happy to sit for any questions. Commissioners, any questions for Luke at this time? All right, thank you, Luke. Uh, Brian. Yes, thank you. Uh, you guys may be noticing a pattern tonight. Uh, lake, lake. A lot of big houses on the lake coming in. Uh, yeah, then they meet all dimensional standards, did a very nice job of demonstrating and uh, meeting the two to one height setback as shown. Um, yeah, have adequate landscaping. Uh, yeah. Pretty straightforward application. Okay, for any questions? Any questions for Brian before we go to Morgan? Let's report. Morgan. I just had a few comments, but all their stormwater items looked good, and I didn't have any additional comments on their stormwater report. Um, this was another one of those lots where it looked like there might be some construction or some removals on the neighboring property from what's already there. Um, so just clarifying if there's permission or 
an easement of some sort to do that removal. Okay. Commissioners, any questions for Morgan? Before we open it. Okay, we'll open this for a public hearing. Is there anybody online or on the phone that would like to comment regarding this application for 1844 Warren Wagon Road? If you're on the phone, you may need to hit star six if you're muted. Anybody here in the audience that would like to comment regarding this application? Right. Anything there, Brian? No. I've been joking. All right. Uh, hearing none, we will close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners, any questions, thoughts? Uh, everything seems to be pretty straightforward with this one. Seems to fit in with all the requirements. Conditions of approval going to take care of a couple of small items, but it seems pretty straightforward. I agree. No questions for me. I think it looks good. Same for me. Tony, anything for you? Make sure you're still awake. Yes, I'm still awake. Uh, Robert, I don't have any questions for you. Even though I may look like I'm asleep in my picture. Oh, you're good. Just glad to see you back. Glad to be back. All right. Um, well, open for motion. I move to approve DR2308 and SH2303 with the staff recommended conditions of approval. Okay, once again, I've got a different number than you've got. I got a shoreline 2304. I noticed so that and I double checked it and I think 2303 is correct. Confirm. <laughs> Second. Okay, 2303 is correct and we have a Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? None. The motion is carried. Hey, great. Right. Thank you. All right. Uh, everybody doing all right? Anybody need a quick break or we're doing good to move forward? Need a drink? Did you bring some? <laughs> we, we can do a pause if you got some beverages to share. <laughs> okay, now we'll move on to design review 2309, scenic route 2306 at 977 Squirrel Lane. Um, Emily Stegner Swart. Drinks to share. No. <laughs> Emily Stegner Schwartz, and my address is, uh, you want my address, right? Yes, please. Um, 2140 Payette Drive. Um, I'm the architect uh, on this project. Um, so, this is my family house um, off of Squirrel, and um, Squirrel Lane is ordered also by so Warren Wagon is the scenic route and then Squirrel. So this property will unusual has three um, three streets on on three sides. So it'll be one street which borders a, a neighboring property. Um, the anything specific you took week jumped. No, I think I just want to kind of explain a little bit about um, there is there's an existing house uh, it's pretty dilapidated. It doesn't have it as a foundation, so um, it's going to be removed. And um, the client wanted to do something uh, with the pretty simple roof line, sort of to mimic some of the early um, early buildings along the lake, which are vernacular kind of style, which is just um, a pretty lightweight structure, simple roof lines. And um, we purposely kind of, uh, detached the house so there can be several green lines through the property. Um, I think it's important that um, these new structures that are going up around um, the hall that have a little bit more transparency through the lot so that people can still drive it down or I can still see to see where the where the lake is. Um, 
it's uh, has. Yeah, it's a I don't I don't know what else to really say about it, uh, but do you want me to just explain the elevations or? Um, to put the elevations, to this. it's just a, a, a stone structure. Um, gabled um, roof and then a, a two story uh, wood clad vertical board um, cedar structure. And um, we also tried to maintain and save as many mature trees. So there are, I believe, there were tagged um, 26 mature trees on the site, 12 inch diameter larger. You're trying to save um, as many well as 22. Um, so it's heavily wooded. Um, and there is a, you know, we also, because it's um, exposed on three sides to streets, trying to create a little bit of a privacy for the, for the owners. And also, um, there's an exterior flat roof uh, patio between the two gabled roofs that, um, that sort of serves as a, like a viewing platform to get up a little bit higher to, to get some lake views. And also get to, to get off the street. So, um, <laughs> and was there going to be? You're looking for like a, a bonus room or apartment type thing, and maybe not apartment above the garage. Not above the garage. Um, at the rear of the garage, we have a guest suite. Um, and um, originally, it was mentioned that you know a guest suite. I mean, as far as um, planning code goes, it can have a bathroom, um, just not a kitchen. And um, we found out that the service system is not allowing any sort of uh, any plumbing at all within the structure of the garage. So um, as far as this permit goes, I think we're just going to remove the bath for now and um, just have a, a guest room without a bathroom. And um, you know, there are some con conditions of approval, but they they are all um, will be handled at the building permit in the building permit process when we re reissue for with structure. Okay. Commissioners, any questions for Emily? Okay, thank you. Uh, Brian, staff report. All right, yes, thank you. Um, this application is new single family residents. Again, uh, meets same criteria. It's a little smaller and uh, than the others. It's still a 34 foot tall structure. Um, yeah, they do a pretty good job. Detached garage, splitting up the elevations into two separate roof lines uh, helps to minimize the scale on it. Uh, the cover or the flat patio uh, between the two seems uh, like a design challenge uh, with snow, uh, but that is uh, not my problem to figure out. Is that roof flat between them or is it a flat roof between the two that are you going to use a uh, heated melt system? Uh, it has the one inch rise to 12. Yeah, inch it's rise just like enough to. Yeah. Right. Um, and at that. You no, know, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I want to interrupt you for this point. Yeah, again, that's not a. Not a code issue, that's just interesting. Um, yeah, generally meets requirements. There's a couple little tweaks to um, reduce the size of the uh, side garage doors um, so that people aren't quite so tempted to drive across unpermitted driveways and things like that. Uh, Add some windows on the garage facade. Uh, yeah, right sewer permit or remove the plumbing in the uh, garage. Uh, that'll stand for your questions. Thank 
Commissioners, any questions for Brian before we go to Morgan's report? Morgan. Um, I didn't have many comments on this project. The only comment is just with these stormwater items, um, but it's below the 5,000 square foot threshold. So it's more just documenting what the stormwater is doing and where it's going um, and how this might affect that historic flow that might be on the property. Um, but I think it's relatively flat of a property, so I don't have too many concerns about it. Okay, great. A question, Brian. Yeah, Tony. Uh, go, go back a couple of frames on your, on your pictures of the building, would you please? They're right there. Whoa, whoa, up one. That's, that's a good one right there. This area in the middle here is this an adjoining deal between the house and the garage. So there's right there a detached garage. And then rotated 90 degrees is the house. Uh, and there, the house gives the appearance of two separate structures, but it's actually one connected unit. So this is kind of this, this is like a breezeway between the two structures, or it's it just looking at it? More or less. Um, here's the roof plan that yeah. building flat roof. And this is going to be a flat area between the two buildings, actually, right? More or less a flat area, yes. Okay, I understand it. Yeah, could be interesting with snow, but I guess everything is anymore, <laughs> at least this year. There's no walkway between the garage and the house. Yeah, well, there's like a stepping stone walkway. But yeah, that you know, structural. Okay. okay. All right, any other questions before we open the public hearing? Okay, at this point we open the public hearing. Is there anybody online or on the phone that would wish to comment regarding this application at 997 Squirrel Lane? If you're on the phone, you might need to hit star six to unmute yourself. Is there anybody here that would like to comment regarding this application? Nope. Hearing none, we will close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners, discussion. This is another one of those straightforward applications. Yeah, I mean, everything's pretty there. I'd, I'd say I'd kind of watch that middle flat roof line. Yeah. Be prepared for snow in between your chimney there and build that stout and do whatever you need to do to protect that, I would say. Hopefully yeah. your builder would understand that. Well, Those. the reason I asked a question about that, Robert, is that I have a situation like that at my house and it's really a difficult deal. I can't imagine anybody wanting to put together something like that. I'm not doing it, and it's not my house. So I just caution the, the builders. It seems like it'd be a lot more, a lot more work than it's worth. We got most of that, Tony. I think you're breaking up a little bit, but I think, yeah, it's kind of to caution them. It's, it could be interesting with snow, but they seem to be yeah. prepared for it. But just design will be there and just <clears throat> hopefully the precautionary items and there to be shoveled, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I'm kind of getting at. But it fits within our scope of approvals or staff's approvals and our approvals. Uh, any other questions, thoughts, motions? I'd say it's pretty, pretty clean. And oh, now they, it's still in here that um, they have to get the sewer permit and everything's part of that, so that will be part of what your discussion is with them and that design will be modified with the bathroom coming out. No plumbing whatsoever in the garage. Yeah. Want to try one? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy one. Just read number one, right? Move to approve the R2309 and SR 2306 with staff recommended conditions of approval. Second. 
All right, we have a motion to approve and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right, motion carries and it's approved. Thank you very much. You guys can go drink now. You're good. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to design review 2310 and scenic route 2307. Uh, address 2212 Warren Wagon Road. Uh, Sean Obermeyer. Yep, Sean here. Yep, Sean is here. Hi, this is Sean. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> 2212 Warren Wagon Road. Um, I'm proposing to remove existing 832 square foot cabin and replace with approximately 3,000 square foot single family home with two car attached garage. Three, three stories with a walkout basement, a wraparound deck facing the lake, and then the top level will just be a, a two bedrooms and a bathroom. We had uh, an issue with, uh, with the roof line, with the head height, but we've corrected that working with Mr. Parker and re, uh, redesigned the roof to get under the 35 feet. We're going to replace any of the uh, ground disturbed by the construction with natural habitat, grass and whatnot. There's also a stormwater plan that was done that shows all the trees on the property, what trees need to be removed. That's the that's the new roof line right there. Okay, uh, commissioners, any questions for the applicant? At this point. Ryan, staff report. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, again, new single family residence, uh, replacing an existing structure. Um, like it stated, we've been working pretty closely on meeting the building height requirements on this one. Uh, there's some confusion on the more restrictive of finished floor or existing grade requirements. Uh, they have provided them. It doesn't look like they've made it into the packet, the new plans. Uh, but they are compliant. Um, the conditions of approval are pretty straightforward. Again, identify snow storage uh, and then get a one foot topo survey prior to construction. So we have a record of where existing grade is uh, in case there are building height questions uh, on construction. So that's prior to start. Okay. Same three questions. Any other questions for Brian at this point? Morgan. I have actually already approved this project, so <laughs> <laughs> they have met all my requirements. That's an easy one for me. Very nice. All right. Um, so is a public hearing, so we'll go ahead and open up for Public hearing, is there anybody online or on the phone that wish to comment regarding this application at 2212 Warren Wagon Road? And if you're on the phone, you may need to hit star six. Is there anybody here in the audience that wish to speak regarding this application? All right, hearing none, we will close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners, once again, this is pretty clean. It's rare that. Um, Engineering is already approved, so that's nice. Uh, looks again pretty straightforward. So, any any thoughts, concerns, questions, motions? I thought you had motions there at the end. No concerns for me. None for me. Ditto. I'm open I'm for a motion. 
Go I move to approve BR2310 and SR2307 with the staff recommended conditions of approval. Second. We have a motion to approve and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion is approved. Approved. Great. Thank, thank you, John. All right. Uh, thank yes, thank you, sir. Moving on to um, sub, sub, sorry, somebody online. No, subdivision twenty three hundred one at on Stockton Drive. Um, we got Heco Engineering. We got Elva Torres. We got Jesse Christensen. We got Jesse Christensen. Jesse Christensen here from Heco Engineers. Uh, our address is fifty seven hundred East Franklin Road, Nampa, Idaho eight three six eight seven. I am not here to share or to uh, show you a property on the lake. I apologize, <laughs> everybody. I'm here to talk about a lot split that we are working on for Elva Torres, uh, Rocio Garcia, and uh, Raul De La Rosa. Actually, I think uh, Rocio and Elva are both back there in the audience. They came straight from work at St. Luke's. To, to come hang out and be part of the process, asking me to speak if I could. I was sharing my screen, but then I messed that up on Teams. I apologize. We'll fix that here shortly. Um, good to see you guys, Brian, Morgan, Meredith. I hope we're all having a great evening. Um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, the Elva moved into the area four years ago, bought this piece of property, looking to find an area to split to share with uh, Rocio and Raul, place that they can live next door to each other. They have, Rocio and Raul have three boys. They all have benefited greatly from the McCall school system. It is way better than where they came from. They're very happy living in the area. So it, it, it seems like a good fit for them. What we've got here is a two acre lot off of Stockton Lane, west east, uh, Stockton Drive, east of your airport that we're looking to split into two, well, it's a 2.3 acre lot, one one acre lot, and then one 1 1.3 acre lot with septic systems and drain fields. Each home will have an individual well. Each one will take access individually off Stockton Drive. We did get a notice from this neighbor that their drain field might be a little close to our well, so we'll probably need to relocate this well to get final approval from Central District Health. They have a copy of our subdivision engineering report. Um, several of the comments, uh, conditions of approval, I mean, all of the conditions of approval are pretty easy to meet. We have one to, a, on the preliminary plat, increase the easement here for snow storage along Stockton from 10 to 12 feet. We'll take care of that, or the surveyor will take care of that. There were some concerns about the that the surveyor is taking care of on the plat for the grid and matching your guys' data up there. I think that's been addressed. I just don't think it's been reviewed yet. Um, and I think that's about it. I think it's a pretty straightforward two lot split with individual septic drain fields for the homes. I can stand for questions. Have you had any septic testing done yet? Um, we had the uh, Southwest or Central District Health was up on site just for test pits, so the soil has been classified. Uh, Raul and Rocio monitored groundwater for a year. The groundwater monitoring data is in and approved by Central District Health as well. Mike Reno has reviewed our our subdivision engineering report. He's ready for the mylar, even if we're not quite ready to send it to him because we want to final get everything finalized and make sure that engineering is happy on your end. Okay, that was for both lots, correct? That was for both lots. Yes, both lots have a test pit on them. Okay. We centralized the drain fields kind of between the two lots or the area for, uh, I'll go back to sharing that real quick. Oh, that's my son. He's a sweetie, turned 13. Uh, test pit was here for the two drain fields centralized between the two lots. It was kind of easier to mark the two and Mike Reno actually suggested the the single test bit from Central District Health. Okay. 
Commissioners, any other questions? This lot appears to be in front of. Well, we can do the starting discussion. Any other questions for the applicant at this point? Brian, staff report. All right, thank, thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you. This application. Uh, normally, you would see it on your consent agenda as a record of survey. As this parcel was modified in 2014, it no longer meets the legal definition of lot of record. Therefore, it is not eligible for that process anymore. So it has to go through the preliminary and final plat. Instead, um, very straightforward subdivision. Most of my comments are uh, typo type things. Uh, they want the preliminary plat is labeled the Rosa subdivision. Everything else is Stockton. Uh, I don't have an opinion on which one is better than the other. Just be consistent. Yeah, I think that's um, uh, mostly my fault. I apologize, Brian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I never finalized that. It says that this property is not located near an industrial use, um, which uh, I don't find that to be very helpful. Uh, so it's <laughs> off. Uh, but other than that, I uh, recommend approval. Any any questions? Any questions for Brian at this point, commissioners? No. Morgan. Great. Um, I, I have a quick nope. well go ahead Morgan and then I'll ask oh because sure. you might answer it <laughs> um most of my comments were on the plat document itself and giving the information on how to meet our digital data submission standards um and then I had a few on the site plan there's two additional driveways being shown on the proposed site plan and the one request is to move one of the driveways or to share two of the driveways because there's an existing driveway to 641 Stockton Drive that is currently on that eastern property line. Um, and then that leads to the second comment that I believe there were culverts installed for 641 Stockton Drive under that driveway to convey some clothes. And I didn't see it on the plan, so just showing where that all is and making sure it's not conflicting with anything that's being planned. Um, so those were my comments. All right, Ryan, what, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, thank you. I guess I, I just saw in one of the public comments about the, the drainage issue going to the west, I guess, and having the proposed driveway go across that. And I was wondering if um, either Morgan or Brian, one of you guys could speak to that and how it could be mitigated. Yeah, so the driveway the is not permitted with this application. They'll have to come back through for driveway permits uh, at the time building permit. We're really just uh, looking at the property boundaries and subdivision design uh, such that it is on this. Um, but yeah, it's a very helpful comment from the neighbor that uh, they should look into as they move forward. Yeah, well, if I say with that west, or excuse me, it'd be the east lot, because there is a driveway that goes back to the property behind, that's the one that, well, the commissioners that may remember that was built sort of without approval or went bigger without our full approval with the, or I should say appropriate design things, but it might be something to consider the applicant to talk with them about sharing that driveway. It's nothing that we have, are gonna you know, require, but, might save a little bit of cost and just have one driveway instead of two side by side that may not fit code. Just something to keep in mind because it's already existing driveway. I don't know how much landscaping he did because we did some buffers that he had to put in along there too. So it may not work, I guess, now that I think about it. Most of the, I believe all the landscaping is back on his own property. Uh, the driveway is in an easement. Uh, I think the bigger challenge is that it is pretty substantially elevated off of Is it? Oh, there. Okay. Well, that may not work. So. Commissioners, any other questions before we go to public hearing? All right, we will open it to a public hearing. Is there anybody online or on the phone that wish to comment regarding this subdivision lot split on Stockton Drive? I'm not going to say star six again. <laughs> uh, anybody here that would like to comment regarding this application? 
Yes, Yes, Kumara. Yes, Hello, good afternoon. My name is uh, Adrian Escobedo. I live 1410 Virginia Boulevard. Uh, Elva is my mom. Percy is my sister. Um, we're going to be splitting these lots and putting them in uh, two homes. We're not going to be renting these. These are going to be. Uh, let's see. They're not going to be rental, is what I'm saying. We're not cutting down any trees. This is a uh, housing for. Central workers, pretty much. Questions? Thank you. Well, it's just comments for you, so we can just let us know. Thank Great, you. thank you. Uh, anybody here? Anybody else would like to comment? Oh. Um, Pat Allen, uh, six fifty Stockton. Um, You know, the ESPYs went through a subdivision process a long time ago. I don't know what year it was, but they elected to put this as a two acre lot. They had the opportunity to do a one acre lot and they didn't do it for some reason all around there. I believe they own 40 acres at the time, went through a subdivision process. It is zoned R1, but you're setting a very bad precedence to um, to divide up, especially a two acre parcel. Um, I mean, you're going to be inundated with other homeowners around that area. But that'd be a nice thing to do is to put that you know, divide up your property, put another house on it. Um, it's not allowed. And go to, to your county off your, you know, that's the other thing I do. do. We go to the county or do we go to the city? Just like, um, um, you know, the storage units that ended up going to the county. So. Who is going to have precedence here? Is it the impact or is it going to be the county? That's a question I have. Um, I do have a picture here that I think that you guys should know. Um, and I took it yesterday. And I can pass this around, but this is a definite crick going right down the road or right down the middle of the subdivision. Uh, Kim and Joe, who live on Samson Trail there, they're, they couldn't be here tonight, but they're, their well is 35 feet. I don't know if anybody knows that. Um, I don't see how this property could even perk. I mean, you are on the low hillside where the the houses are located, but this creek is huge right now, and people need to go drive by that. You guys have allowed two other properties, Carpies, the one that you mentioned on there, Robert, um, with no consequences. I mean, it was built way too big. It's a steel building. It's uglier than hell, and you know, nothing became of it. They put a couple trees in. They said put some windows in there. We put, I personally 